I think it's a few minutes after 10, so we're going to start this meeting of the Transportation Committee for the New York State Assembly. Um, and I guess, hold on a second. I am. Again, I'd like to say this is the uh, Standing Committee on Transportation in the New York State Assembly. Um, we're having a, a hearing basically on complete streets. And I'd like to say good morning to everyone and welcome you to this hearing. I am Assemblyman Bill Magnarelli, the Chair of the Assembly Standing Committee on Transportation. I'm pleased to be joined this morning by my colleagues, Mr. Walsick and Mr. DiStefano, Ms. Fahey, and Mr. Rivera. So uh, I want to welcome them all to the panel, and I'm sure we're going to be joined by a few others as the morning progresses. As stated in the public hearing notice of this hearing, the Complete Streets Law was enacted in 2011 to achieve a cleaner, greener transportation system by requiring the transportation plans of New York State to consider, okay. Are we set? We'll wait. Thank you. All right. As noted in the public hearing notice of the, for this hearing, the Complete Streets Law was enacted in 2011 to achieve a cleaner, greener transportation system by requiring the transportation plans of, the New, of New York State to consider the needs of all roadway users, both motorized and non-motorized, in, constru in roadway construction projects, pedestrians, bicyclists, public transportation riders, motorists, and citizens of all ages and abilities, including children, the elderly and the, dis uh, and the disabled, have use of the roads, and the complete street law is intended both to put active consideration of their needs and implementation of roadway features to address those needs into practice. Complete street roadway design features may include sidewalks, lane striping, bicycle lanes, paved shoulders suitable for use by bicyclists, signage, crosswalks, pedestrian control signals, bus pullouts, curb cuts, raised crossways, ramps, and traffic calming measures. Under the current Complete Streets Law, the Department of Transportation or the agency with jurisdiction is required to consider the convenient access and, and mobility on the road network by all users of all ages through the use of Complete Street design features in planning, design, construction, reconstruction, and rehabilitation of transportation projects which are undertaken by the DOT or which receive both federal and state funding and are subject to DOT oversight. The law exempt, exempts resurfacing, maintenance, and pavement recycling projects and exempts projects where the agency determines and sets forth in publicly available documents that certain factors exist. The Assembly Standing Committee on Transportation is holding this hearing in order to review and assess various aspects of the complete streets law as it is currently implemented. We are interested in obtaining testimony on the existing law, whether modifications to this law should be considered, and the policy and fiscal implications of any proposed statutory changes to this law. We also are interested in obtaining information on the extent to which local governments 
across the state have implemented their own complete streets policies and the impact of those policies on local transportation projects. I would like to thank in advance all the witnesses for their participation in today's hearing and to remind everyone to please limit their statements to 10 minutes. Before I call the first witness to present testimony, I would like to ask my colleagues if they have any opening remarks that would that they would like to make at this point in time. Joseph? No, I'm good. Mr. Walsh? Ms. Fahey? Uh, yes. Um, I would just like to say uh, thank you. Thank you for holding this hearing. I just, uh, just very briefly, um, I have a bill pending on this that I'm anxious for the governor to sign. I know there are a number of bills. Complete Streets, while it passed a, a number of years ago, it's not been as fully implemented as we would like. And just, uh, well, uh, the average, we lose about 300 pedestrians a year to fatalities, um, thousands and thousands more. Uh, complete streets work. Uh, you just itemized a whole host of uh, ways to complete our streets. And um, so I want to commend you for this hearing. And I look, I look forward to hearing from our entire list of panels. Um, but these are preventable deaths. And I want to commend, we have a number of families here uh, who have suffered uh, extraordinary loss uh, in many ways that uh, could be prevented. So I also want to commend the families, uh, whether it's with transportation alternatives or families for safe streets. I, I want to commend them for continuing to honor the lives of their families or, or lost uh, children or family members by continuing to speak out. So thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rivera. No, thank you. No. All right, uh, then we're re ready to call the first witness, uh, which uh, was supposed to be a panel, but it's going to be Mr. Andrew Avery, president of the New York State County Highway Superintendents Association. Mr. Avery. Good morning. Morning. How are you guys today? And ma'am. Thank you, Chairman Magnarelli and members of the Assembly Transportation Committee for this opportunity to discuss New York's consideration of Complete Streets Design Law, its implementation by municipalities, and potential future modifications of the statute. I am Andrew Avery, President of the New York State County Highway Superintendents Association. We expected Rich Benjamin, president of the New York State Association of Town Superintendents of Highway, to be here today, but unfortunately he was unable to attend. Our two organizations work closely together on our mutual goals of effectively maintaining the local system of roads and bridges, over 87% of the state's roads and over 50% of the bridges. Like you, we want to enhance the safety of motorists and others who use local roads while also being responsible to taxpayers. Since the Complete Streets Review Statute was enacted in 2011, features that accommodate and facilitate convenient access and mobility by current and projected bicyclists, pedestrians, and individuals of all ages and abilities have proliferated. Moreover, several municipalities have adopted Complete Streets policies and guidance that successfully promote the additions of sidewalks, paved shoulders suitable for joggers and bicyclists, lane striping, dedicated bike lanes, share the road signage, crosswalks, road diets, pedestrian control signalization, bus pullouts, curb cuts, raised crosswalks, and ramps and traffic calming measures. There is no one-size-fits-all approach. Some of these efforts call for the development of a comprehensive plan for complete streets policies that many times include recommended changes to local zoning law and subdivision regulations. Since complete streets features such as signage, pavement markings, and crosswalks are relatively inexpected, in, excuse me, inexpensive, and construction features usually require a more significant initial investment. By identifying the need and resources for these features early in the project process, we avoid costly redesign or retrofitting later. Our associations have long recognized the importance of creating an environment that promotes healthier lifestyles and provides optimal transportation accessibility and choices for communities, residents, and visitors. We work closely with our elected officials at all levels of government to respond to the transportation needs and desires of our communities. 
A major goal of the state's Complete Streets program is to achieve a significant reduction in traffic fatalities and serious injuries in all public roads. According to information compiled by the State Department of Transportation, over 165 municipalities throughout the state have notified the department that they have adopted pro-complete streets policies. We hope to grow this number by working through our respective affiliated organizations, the New York State Association of Counties and the associations of towns of the state of New York. In fact, NYSEC at its recent fall conference approved a resolution to encourage counties that have not already done so to adopt local resolutions to promote complete streets designs within their jurisdictions were practical and affordable. The Department of Transportation checklist assists municipalities in the identification of needs for complete streets design features on capital projects, including locally administered projects funded by a combination of state and local dollars. Complying with the checklist requires the involvement of local transit providers, MPOs, and NISDOT regional program areas, including traffic and safety, landscape architecture, and maintenance divisions. These steps must be revisited if there are project delays or site condition changes. Continued coordination with the NISDOT Regional Bicycle and Pedestrian Coordinator is necessary throughout the project scoping plan and design. The checklist is part of the comprehensive review process requiring time, expertise, engineers and consultants, and costs for both the state and local highway departments. Under the current law, complete streets review is required on roads that are both state and federally funded and rightly excludes mandatory review for resurfacing, maintenance, or pavement recycling projects. We think for the reasons mentioned, the current law works well as highway departments collaborate with many stakeholders and user groups when planning road work. While some bills introduced in the legislature are presented as tweaks to the existing statute, we see them as having a significant impact on costs and delays for some critical road projects. In fact, applying complete streets review to all state funded projects as one bill proposes, would include many small culvert maintenance and replacement projects and may mandate complete streets review for countless inappropriate road and highway segments, such as on roads classified as rural. Further, another bill would include maintenance, resurfacing, or pavement recycling projects as subject to review as well. In light of the efforts we previously discussed taking place at the local level to promote complete streets features whenever feasible and affordable, Legislation that seeks to unnecessarily expand the types of highway projects that are subject to complete streets review would create a costly burden on local highway departments. This, despite it being obvious from the get-go that the majority of exclusively state-funded projects and rural road mileage is not an appropriate candidate for complete streets features. In these cases, a municipality would need to determine if the use of the road by bicyclists and pedestrians is prohibited by law, the cost would be disproportionate to the need by factors such as land use, current and projected traffic volumes, and population density. There is a demonstrated lack of need or lack of community support, or the use of the design features would have an adverse impact on public safety. These bills would subject several sections of local highway to inappropriate and financially burdensome review, despite the anticipated high probability of a finding that complete streets designs are unsupportable. I'll now read the rest of the testimony on behalf of Rich Benjamin and the Town Superintendents of Highway Association. Funding for local transportation projects is mainly from the state formula aid programs available to all local governments like CHIPS, which is significantly underfunded relative to need. There is a disconnect between what type of roads make up the local system, who pays for their maintenance, and how complete streets upgrades would be funded. New York's 933 towns are home to 8 out of 10 New Yorkers outside of New York City. Towns maintain 1,114, 355 lane miles of roads, or 63% of the local road system. Even though we maintain 63% of the system, we receive only 31% of CHIPS funding. That translates to $1,467 per lane mile. New York City gets $9,387 per lane mile, other cities in the state get $3,878 per lane mile. As a result, nearly 80% of the cost of maintaining the town's roads are borne by its local taxpayers, the highest rate of any level municipality in the state. As we look at expanding complete streets legislation, we should also look at what type of roads make up the town system. Nearly 80,000 lane miles, or 70%, are classified as rural. 
Another nearly 19,000 lane miles, or 16%, are unpaved. Consequently, highway departments make sure they participate in and apply for federal funding when available to support complete streets projects. However, less than 13% of our local roads are eligible for federal highway assistance. For instance, the vast majority of towns are not eligible to participate in most federal aid transportation programs. For example, in 2021, the state awarded $178.8 million to 75 communities across New York State for projects promoting environmentally friendly modes of travel, making it easier and safer to walk, bike, or hike. This funding comes from the Transportation Alternatives Program and Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality Improvement Program. Of the amount allocated to New York under this program, only 18 of the state's over 900 towns received one of the 75 grants awarded. It is important to note the majority of the state's 933 town highway departments do not have in-house engineering staff and would have to hire consultants to do the complete streets analysis for even the most basic maintenance projects. This will increase project costs by up to one-third, and this occurs before ever determining if a complete streets design improvement is even warranted or sensible. As mentioned, while the concept of designing and constructing roads using the complete streets philosophy is well-intentioned and already aggressively pursued by municipalities wherever practical, the unfunded mandates contained in these legislative measures would add to the local transportation system's already poor ratings and safety concerns. Funds are simply not currently available to do the routine maintenance and many basic safety improvements necessary to our system. These bills, if enacted, could result in measurable compromises to the convenience and safety of the traveling public. According to a report issued by New York State Comptroller Thomas Dinopoli on January 28, 2022, locally owned roads by the numbers, local governments, excluding New York City, spent $2 billion on road maintenance and improvements in the 2020 fiscal year. The report highlighted a 2013 study of local highway and bridge needs published by our association based in part in a 2007 transportation needs assessment by NISDOT, which found that locally owned roads would need about $32 billion over 15 years to restore locally owned roads through repaving and improvements. The report estimate that there was a spending gap of $1.3 billion a year for locally owned roads and bridges. In 2017, our association updated that needs estimate to $1.7 billion annually. These huge funding gaps on the local system do not take into consideration the most recent U.S. Labor Department Produce Price Index, which shows that the cost of highway and street construction has increased over 20% in the past 12 months. This includes steel, up 113%, plastic construction products, up 35%, and diesel fuel, up over 50%. A reality for highway departments, both state and local, is the existence of barriers to developing, committing to, and moving forward with complete streets projects. These include funding. Complete streets features can easily add 30% to a project's cost. More if sidewalk, vault, sidewalk vaults called areaways under the walkways are included. Right-of-way acquisition, it's not included in a 30% figure. This can be a costly and time-consuming process, especially when many of the roads are right away by use and are not outright owned by the municipality. Uh, the concrete walks are expensive. Typical bid price for a concrete ADA accessible corner ramp is $3,000 to $5,000 per ramp. 20 years ago, that figure was more like 500 to 750, so it's really exploded. Uh, competing system demands. Culverts and expensive critical bridge projects may command priority for structural and safety reasons. Road widening. Additional width needed for bike lines for bike lanes and other uses increases the pavement and sub-base cost, requires right-of-way acquisition and more expensive pavement markings. Environment and resilience. State climate goals and resiliency requirements reallocate scarce capital resources. Supply chain and inflation. Rising construction costs, shortage, and delays in material and equipment del deliveries are plaguing all construction work and maintenance budgets. Maintaining complete streets features going forward needs to be accounted for as it requires additional capital expenses and operating costs, such as regularly cleaning debris from bike paths and snow removal from sidewalks. In conclusion, the concept of designing and constructing roads using the complete streets philosophy is supported by everyone and is aggressively being pursued by municipalities wherever practical. 
As always, we look forward to continuing to discuss with you and your legislative colleagues ways in which we can work together to assure that complete streets designs are considered and installed whenever and wherever appropriate and affordable. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. First of all, I'd, I'd just like to, oh, we've got two new, uh, two more members who have just uh, joined us, Joanne Simon and Dee Dee Barrett. Um, do either of you want to say something? Uh, any opening remarks before we get into questions? No, thank you. No? No, okay. Um, all right, well, as chair, I'll start. How's that, okay? I thank you, first of all, for your testimony. It's, it's, it's very concise, and, and it really kind of hits why I, I have sat down with program and council staff and my staff to have this hearing. Um, I think you ended by saying that uh, the concept of designing and constructing roads using complete streets philosophy is supported by everyone and aggressively being pursued by municipalities whenever practical. Yes, I believe that's true, okay? Just so I hear you on that. Um, the problem is, is how do we keep that moving? Um, we don't want it to fall apart, so to speak. Uh, it's not something that's gonna go away in any way, shape, or form. I think people are looking to do complete streets more and more and more and, uh, and are taking advantage of them, and it is costly. Okay, what I wanna know is, that in particular, and I think your testimony <clears throat> spells it out uh, pretty well, um, you know, just how much of a burden this is going to be on municipalities if we did some of the changes to the law, basically making it a mandate on just about every project that's undertaken uh, dealing with a road uh, in a town, uh, you know, across New York State. What will the need be? Am I reading this correctly? Am I hearing you co correctly that right now we are $1.7 billion a year short on what we need just to maintain roads? That's correct, sir. Okay, so if we're going to do more, we've got to find over $1.7 billion to put into the budget to allow us to do even in more in, these, in this yes, area. Sir. Probably another half billion, so you're up in the $2.2 billion annually range, sir. Okay. Um, I want to be, I want to understand correctly. Um, if we were to, to change the legislation to bring in any project that is uh, federally or state funded in any way, um, you say the cost will be about a third higher just to do a complete street, okay? But I'm just looking at what would the initial cost be? When, when, that, when that project is proposed, if it was mandated that you had to look at complete streets, what's, what happens? T tell me what happens at that point in time. We, in Shimon County, we actually currently have a complete streets policy that we follow. So, for example, we use DOT's checklist, and we run through that to determine whether it's not only practicable, or practical, but also practicable, can we afford it. Uh, many of our roads, we do make the improvements. Usually, we're investing a lot of uh, federal dollars, uh, whether it's uh, a north-south bicycle connector through our county we're building, a uh, pedestrian safety action plan we've undertaken. We're one of the first counties in New York State to adopt a, formally adopt a local road safety plan. So safety is foremost in our thoughts. Getting people home safe at night is critical. Once you determine though that you have to build a complete streets feature based on need in the DOT checklist, uh, you're looking at an engineering cost of probably 10 to 15% of the total cost of construction. Uh, so if you have a complete streets feature that's $100,000, you're looking at another $10,000 in, in engineering. We're fortunate at the county level that we typically do have in-house engineering, but at the town levels, as mentioned, there are very few in-house engineering staff. Okay. All right. 
There was one other question that I wanted to ask, and now I can't remember what it is. When you're talking about putting together uh, planning, okay, and many of the towns have already done this, would it be uh, advantageous to basically say to all the towns, to everybody, that within a certain period of time, you must come up with a plan to do complete streets over a period of time? Again, we support complete streets. What that time frame is, I think you're going to have to put some financial investment toward. Uh, a perfect example is it's, it's a little known feature in the, the CHIPS law, but it actually says you can't build lane, bike lanes using CHIPS funds. Uh, so that's something that would need to be looked at if, if you went to not just federal and state, <laughs> <Get that. laughs> but federal or state funding. If we were using CHIPS, CHIPS funding and we have to do complete streets features, it is now mandating that we have to do it with local dollars, whether that's bonding or general funds. So it becomes even more difficult. Okay. Um, another question I have for the towns would be that in this planning process, is it possible to do complete streets in, I don't want to call it a piecemeal way, but it, I think in your testimony, you talk about safety. You talk about pulling out certain things that are needed, that, that you've already decided we should have complete streets in these areas. Can the planning be geared to that? In other words, first phase, making sure there are you know, ways of getting north and south, east and west in a town by a bicyclist, by people who want to walk, and kind of prioritizing where we're going at, and, and at the same time, not mandating that every single project is, but have some planning out there that the community too, the way I'm you know, thinking about this, is that there would be maybe a hearing or some kind of a, a proposal where the public comes together and says, we would like to see this in a certain place or that in a certain place. Is that feasible or is that I, not only do I think it's feasible, I think it's important uh, to have that document in place, uh, much like the local road safety plans that many communities are undertaking now, uh, to have that document that tells you what needs to be done, where it needs to be done, and how much it's going to cost is a great tool for getting federal funding, whether it's safety funding, TAP mm -hmm. funding. Uh, it, it is a I just can't speak enough to having that plan in place. So I think if the state were able to fund local road safety plans that included a complete streets project planning component, that would be terrific. Other states have done that. Uh, New York, the counties and towns are, and even the cities are left to their own devices to come up with a local road safety plan. Okay. Uh, just one addition to that, a Fred Heights with the Association of Towns. There are nine levels of roads within the local system. You, you would look at that within which of those nine you would want to do that with. To, to start doing that analysis of, of dirt pavement road, dirt roads, you know, I, that's why we have these, all these classifications within the local system. I think you, you would look at those that made sense within the system, so those specific roads are being dealt with, not those that, that would not necessarily e even qualify in sense of, of being able to have those changes made to them. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Joseph. <clears throat> Thank you for uh, coming here and giving us your testimony. I have a couple of questions coming from Long Island. Um, the bike lanes uh, that we currently have in a lot of our communities, they're not very well used. Um, you know, it's taken up an, a, a lane of traffic, basically, uh, where you used to have two lanes of traffic, now you only have one lane of traffic, uh, and the bike lanes are not being used. Is there anything we could do as legislators, as officials, to kind of invigorate that to try and get more people to use it? Because honestly, you know, it, it seems like in most communities, especially for where I come from, it's like a waste of money that we spent all this money and nobody uses it. Um, is there something that can point us into a direction to get it to be more used? 
I think bike lanes by themselves are they're an important component of the overall plan, but most beginning cyclists do not want to be on the same road as cars going 30, 40, 50 miles an hour, even if there's a bike lane, because they're still pretty close to you. So designing it properly such that there's actually space between the moving cars and the, the bike lane is something that can help. But again, that costs more money, uses more right of way. Uh, separate bike facilities that are parallel to the roads are, are very good for beginning cyclists. Uh, as somebody that has been a cyclist much of my life, I don't mind riding by traffic, but you're not going to get children and people that have just gone out to a bike shop that want to ride right next to traffic, particularly when you have catch basins along the road, drainage basins that may be lower, which make it difficult for bikes. Uh, the road may not be swept enough. Uh, again, that's hard on bikes, not so hard on cars. Uh, so there's little things to do with maintenance that could be improved that could certainly make bike, plane, bike lanes more palatable for use. One last question. Um, upstate communities, uh, like I said, I come from Long Island, but I have a lot of friends and people that I know from upstate with the limited resources that we have available uh, as far as funding, um, what is being done to uh, facilitate when bad weather comes? Um, wh what are we doing about you know, getting the roads acclimated to the idea that there's bad weather and getting people around in bad weather? I, I assume, sir, that your question pertains to the complete streets <laughs> facilities in bad weather. Uh, well, for example, in Elmira, sidewalks, uh, are maintained by the adjacent property owner. Unless it's a uh, government sidewalk, then, then we maintain them. Uh, we plow our paved roads edge to edge, uh, but you're also putting, in the rural areas, you're usually putting down a mix of salt and sand. So if somebody's trying to ride a bike in winter because they have to, you're gonna have more grit on the road. Uh, that is certainly problematic. Uh, salt works Quickly, it's not as gritty, but it's not great for the environment. Uh, and the cost have skyrocketed. Some parts of the state went from $60 a ton to $90 a ton this year. Uh, so I, I think wintertime is a difficult part of Complete Street, something that we need uh, more research on uh, to ensure <coughs> that uh, the cyclists that are trying to ride in winter, uh, pedestrians, we're all pedestrians every day. so. We need to make sure that those walks are taken care of. That can become a code enforcement issue uh, as much as anything. Thank you. So, thanks. So you are from the city of Amira. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, and Shimon County, or are you still with Shimon? Uh, I work for Shimon County. I actually live in Elmira. Gotcha, gotcha. So, um, how many reconstructions do you do for the city of Elmira in an average year? Reconstructions? Uh, usually one to two full depth reconstructions. Sure. And how many resurfacing, mill and fills, maintenance jobs? Anywhere from 15 to 20, depending on uh, the length and width of the roads. So using your municipality as an example, and I'm sure it's pretty consistent, and actually I should preface this, but before I came here, I actually worked for my county highway department, so I'm familiar a bit with your, with your world. And I'd say that our, uh, granted our county was a little bigger, I'm from Erie County, so, but our ratio is probably pretty similar in that we do far more uh, mill and fills and, and resurfacing jobs than we do reconstructions. I think one of the reasons that, I, that people are so interested in pursuing this where in which we wouldn't solely apply the consideration of complete streets to reconstructions versus also considering them for resurfacing is for that exact thing. You do one or two resurfacings, uh, you, I'm sorry, you do one or two reconstructions a year, meanwhile you do a dozen plus resurfacings. So you could imagine where if we're looking at trying to put forth something a bit broader and, and make more, more headway, we wouldn't solely be looking at the kind of things that we only do once a year as opposed to looking at things that we do 12 to 15 times a year. I'd also wonder, would you say that the biggest, um, I shouldn't say opposition, because maybe that's not a fair word, but 
the biggest concern that people have in your organization is purely a financial one, or do you feel like there's some other limitation that's greater than that? Well, I, I don't want to speak for everybody sure. in both the county and town organizations, but what I would say is it's more of a financial issue. Mm -hmm. uh, again, safety is foremost in our minds. Sure. Um, it's, and it comes back to that plan. Uh, you're talking about how to get it onto the resurfaced streets versus just the reconstructed. Sure. If you have a plan in place, like we're doing with our north-south bicycle connector right now, we're working with all the municipalities that that route runs through, mm -hmm. trying to time their resurfacing projects so that we're not grinding striping and putting new striping down, trying to sure. make it a more efficient project. So I, I think that coordination and having a plan in place are, are sure. going to help bring it to the resurfacing level. And I looked up in, in both Shimon County and Elmira, both passed resolutions supporting a complete streets planning. And they didn't, at least from what I can read, didn't designate solely resurfacing versus solely reconstructions. It seemed to just be sort of broad to say that they support it in general. Yes, sir. Now, wearing that hat as head of your highways department, are you, you are considering complete streets when you're not solely doing reconstructions then, correct? Anytime we pave, we consider complete streets. Mm -hmm. And in that consideration of an average paved job, is the cost so much more so when you're doing it? I mean, granted, every road's a bit different, and I get that. But on an average road that gets average traffic? So, for example, this year we're doing, uh, this year or next year, we're doing a project on North Main Street in Elmira. It's right in the middle of downtown. Uh, it is a locally funded project. We are redoing parts of the sidewalks because it was determined they needed to be redone. That is adding $80,000 to a $300,000 project. Mm -hmm. uh, but to sidewalks that already existed? Sidewalks that already existed. So it's not like you're adding new sidewalks. We're not adding new. Okay. This is so that's just maintenance of existing infrastructure. Maintenance so that uh, Which it you would have done anyways. the job it was intended to do. Yeah, yeah. But that you would have done anyways, with or without a complete streets plan or not plan if it's if you have existing sidewalk that needed to be fixed then it's would i yes yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely so um prior to the passage of those resolutions by your municipalities did your municipality have a complete streets plan or did it or was it produced in response to that passage i was produced in response to that I would say that we had already put a local road safety plan in place. Mm -hmm. uh, we had started working a pedestrian safety action plan. Uh, so I, whether you call it complete streets or not, it's one component of mm -hmm. safety for all users. But it's fair to say, and granted, you can't speak for all the members of the larger association, that the majority of them wouldn't have put a complete streets plan together if they put one together until their independent re municipalities pass resolutions? That's probably a reasonable statement. So is it fair to say that you know the, the thing that we're pursuing here potentially with expanding it truthfully won't happen until it's a law that's passed and municipalities are sort of you know guided in that direction? By that I'm asking, do you think municipalities like in the case of yours where you sort of consider it even though you, you're, you're applying those principles regardless of whether it's a reconstruction project or not, do you feel as though more municipalities will follow suit once we expand it? I think they won't have a choice sure. for the matter. Uh -huh. uh, but short of that, I think many municipalities are moving forward uh, even without mm -hmm. any input from the state. Uh, mm -hmm. As I mentioned, there are, are numerous towns, villages, cities that have adopted complete, or complete streets policies, including the town of Big Flats in, in our county, mm -hmm. uh, which is our biggest commercial district town. Uh, I think you're going to see more of that. Uh, the New York State Association of Counties, as I mentioned, passed a resolution that's encouraging municipalities and counties in particular to undertake a complete streets policy. So I think even without the state stepping in, we know it's the right thing to do. It's how do we afford it? Mm -hmm. I, just... so, one other, I mean, similar to what you said before about salt. Right before I left my county, I, I saw how expensive it, it had gotten. Part of me thinks just as much as if salt prices go up, you're sort of in a position where you're not going to go without salt, or you're not going to go out with some sort of, you know, icing deterrent. Similar to this, I, I think that if we don't legislate this issue, if we don't make it something that we can pass in this body, 
uh, I don't think individual municipalities will have the open-mindedness that you do on, in yours. I think in my experience dealing with folks in, in the state around this issue, it's, it's certainly a financial concern in some respects, uh, but in, in, I, I'm still of the thought that there's still a sort of mindset issue that we have, and that is that bike lanes are X, or that striping is this, or adding these kind of lights are this way, and, and I certainly wouldn't want you to, 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 to put you on the spot that way, and I, you know, about your, the members of your association, but what I'd say is there's, there's a potential to do a lot, I think, and it's, and it's sometimes uh, dismissed because it's perceived to be another thing that you gotta do or, or whatever the concern is, but I think there's a potential here where we can pursue this uh, and it not be all that expensive, that, 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 that things can be done that, that uh, you know, that can make this possible. I'm, I'm a believer, it's my bill, so obviously I'm not gonna be that objective about it. Uh, I think it's great, but I'm, I'm also one to be uh, uh, a believer that th things can be uh, tweaked and, and, and adjusted to make, to make the most sense, but. If I could yeah, address course. that. So if you look at Erie County, where you mentioned, and uh, Chemung County, Erie is a largely urban county, suburban county, has rural areas. People don't realize that, but it does have some really rural areas. Same with Shimon County. We have an urban center with rural areas. So I, I think, as Fred mentioned earlier, you really need to look at the road classification, and maybe you don't apply the same strict rules to a road that is never going to see the need uh, for these kind of features. So maybe there's a way to do that and accomplish both. Yeah. And, and similar to what you said earlier about your checklist. I mean, if you have this checklist that's evenly and uh, consistently applied across every road project that you have, then a lot of those projects that are dirt roads that probably should have never been roads to begin with, they'll, they'll be ruled out, I bet, um, because your checklist would, would do that. And as long as you're doing that consistently on, on every project, that, that should be a thing. Could you, and then from the town's perspective, uh, mm -hmm. a couple of points. For the counties, I think in the area, you've got, the, you know, Bill usually says you've got 22 to the Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and give your name. Uh, it's, uh, Fred Haifa, um, former first deputy at state DOT and a consultant to the Town Highway Superintendents Association. Uh, so one of the difficulties is, is looking at this in a full picture. And we use state DOT, for example. Right now, their limited resources on their paving, having them using, based on their own analysis, using the wrong treatments, less expensive ones, on almost 50% of the work they did last year. And when we have situations on the local system, we're much greater. The, the state system is only 13% of the entire system. The locals take care of 87%. In Erie County, you've got 22 bridges that are beyond their useful life. If you continue to add resources and move them to other things, does that become 23, 24, 25? At what point is it a safety issue and an emergency issue? It always has to be weighed in. At the same time, what we're looking at is when we see these increase in cost for CDLs, our snowplow drivers. We have 933 communities. We take care of a quarter of the state systems on top of our huge system. We've had open solicitations in some of our communities for two years, and we can't get people to hire, because we pay 22 to $30 an hour. With prevailing wage, you're gonna make $78 an hour. There's a bill that has passed both houses on aggregate deliveries now, just for CDL drivers. So we as municipalities who can't hire plow drivers, now could be potentially paying, if the governor signs it, up to $78 before overtime for or drivers that compete for the same jobs our folks are. So it's, you know, there, there's a lot that goes into, so, and then if we don't have the drivers, at what point is it three inches of snow on the road versus the inch and a half that we, we, we want to limit ourselves to for safety purposes? This all has to be weighed in whenever these additional incremental costs are weighed into the system. There is an implication for safety. So we're just asking that all of that be considered when you look at it. I suppose what I'd say is we are forever going to have the burden in local government of not paying our employees enough. But I'd also say that the roads that belong to our municipalities are our responsibilities. And we're going to resurface them anyways, or we're going to reconstruct them anyways. And when we do, we should consider all options. And I think we do. I mean, 95% of the local highway superintendents in this state are elected officials every two years. Most of them. 
they are in touch with their community. If they're not doing their job, if they're not doing and providing the services and, and the type of transportation that's necessary, you lose. Just like with everyone here. I, I don't know that it has to be mandated to, to, as a public official to do the right thing for your community. I think you're allowing that elected official who's the professional to make those determinations with their community versus a one-size-fits-all. I think that's really important. Okay. Um, Ms. Barrett. Thank you. Um, I didn't realize that, uh, that the CHIPS money was not, you couldn't use it for bike lanes. I, I feel like there's a lot of goals that we all share that we want to achieve here, um, increasing, um, you know, less fuel using cars or vehicles on the road, you know, more more sustainable transportation options. Um, we want to uh, make it safe, obviously. There's th I think these are the things I think we all share as goals. What would you say would be the best way for the state to be moving forward? I get the more money to do whatever you, you, know, you wanna be doing, but what, what other approach could we be taking to ensure that bikes and, and uh, other things become part of, and I know that there's no one size fits all. I live in and represent two fairly uh, rural counties, a lot of country roads, Dutchess and Columbia counties. It's not you know, like Elmira necessarily or Syracuse or the city or any of those others. It's kind of got its own unique things, but how could we, how could we be approaching this in a way that you feel would be productive and, and make sense for all of us? I think it comes back to the plan if the state could assist the municipalities in developing the plan, because that's what we're talking about here. You're asking us to look at complete streets for every project. Well, maybe if the state came forward and said, we're gonna help you develop that <coughs> formal plan so that as you move forward, you already will know if this warrants complete streets features. Uh, it may be a great boon for safety to have that plan in place you could use, then use that to go to the federal government and say, hey, we've got a plan in place. Can you give us federal safety money to start implementing parts of that? Uh, which is what we did in Shimon with our local road safety plan. We formally adopted that plan and within a year, we had three and a half million dollars of federal safety money that we would not have got otherwise. So I, I think if the state can be uh, more supportive of statewide plans that can help the municipalities that don't have the in-house engineering staff uh, to overcome this initial expense. We're all supportive of safety. We're all supportive of complete streets. We just want to make sure it's done in a way that we can afford it and not have other issues. So that plan, I think, is an important first step. Could I add to that, too? Because within the testimony, we did talk about the different reimbursement rates for CHIPS based on municipality levels. A lot of that was created back when these were these municipalities back in the 1920s were, were, were in essence, their, their, their current configurations were taking place. But the vast majority of those back then, everything was in the cities as far as manufacturing, transportation. So, so now you have, you know, since the 1970s, I think it's like a 121% increase in the town's population in the state and almost a quarter of the state's population within cities is gone yet we're still getting one-fifth the reimbursement rate for the same work that a city gets when you're, when you're a, a rural or when you're a, a, a town. So I, I think when you talk about that's where the vast majority of where you'd like to see these improvements, why is the reimbursement rate so disproportionate for your communities? We, Look. We, we got to reassess these things. I absolutely agree. Yeah, no, it's, and, and as more people are working at home, um, they're not in the cities, and they're, but those are the people who want to travel by bike and other things, and they should be... That should be part of the lifestyle choices, their safety. Absolutely. Ms. Simon. Thank you. Is this on? It's on. Okay. So I have a, a couple of questions um, based on your, your testimony. <clears throat> One is um, you, you talked a couple of times about uh, making improvements and uh, based on whether or not they're appropriate and affordable, um, which uh, I'm curious as to what criteria you're using for that. So, for example, there are a lot of obligations under federal law for curb cuts, which you talked about uh, being much more expensive now. Um, so, uh, number one who, uh, criteria, what, 
what criteria are you using or are you proposing? Um, who decides uh, what those criteria are and who decides whether it's appropriate and affordable? Um, and uh, what was, for example, what was limiting uh, you from doing curb cuts when they were $500 each uh, until now when they're 5,000? I'll address those separately, starting with the, the, mm -hmm. the ADA ramps. In Elmira, we've been doing those since 1991. I believe the ADA law was passed in 1990, uh, and we were doing them back when they were $200 a ramp. Uh, the standards keep changing, uh, so we have to keep updating those curb ramps to meet the new standards when we rebuild a road, uh, and now they, they do cost more. Uh, and we do that, whether it's a county road, a city road, town roads, uh, we're well aware of uh, the federal requirement for ADA ramps, even when you're just doing a resurfacing. Um, as far as the criteria, we're following the DOT checklist. Uh, and then as it stands right now, it's really up to the municipality to decide what is affordable or practicable. Uh, and that could be different for every municipality depending on their resources. Different depending on um, uh, like who would be the decision maker or decision makers? Uh, even that I would say could be different. Uh, whether it's a legislature or a town board uh, that's making a decision. Uh, in our case, we, our legislature passed the complete streets policy so we report back to them but we also have a county executive who approves everything going to the legislature. Um, you know, you also talked a little bit about um, uh, having the state help with that. Um, I also hear from your testimony concern about one size fits all. So how do you propose the state to come up with a plan that isn't one size fits all, that assists the, the local um, municipalities in effectuating the plan in updating that checklist, uh, deciding what's appropriate, what are those criteria, et cetera? I don't have a perfect answer for you right mm -hmm. now. Uh, I think it's, again, collaboration with our regional DOTs, perhaps, and then some guidance from main office state DOT uh, to, to push it forward. It, it comes down to those classifications of the roadway types as to what's appropriate. We have roads that have 60 feet of pavement, county roads, uh, in the urban areas. Then we have some that have 22 feet of pavement in the rural areas. Should they be looked at the same? Probably not. Uh, they have far different traffic volumes. You know, I, I don't want to compare Chemung County to Erie County with the volumes they have, but our highest volume road in Chemung County is about 20,000 vehicles a day, local road. The state has some higher volume roads. And you take our lowest volume, and you might be at you know, a couple hundred vehicles a day. So you have to treat those differently. And I think that plan could address it. Towns are very similar. They're going to have very low volume roads. We have different standards uh, for low volume roads. ASHTO provides, that's the American Association of State uh, Highway and Transportation Officials provides different standards for low volume and higher volume roads. So I think we have to have those same kind of differing standards uh, for how we apply complete streets and lower uh, classifications. If I, if I could just add to that too, and, and you may be aware of this, but as, as you get your, your annual reports on the state of the roads within the DOT system, by your region, you know what they are, you never get that in the local system. So you have literally 87% of the state system, you have no guidelines for what are those conditions. So we as an association have go out and, and hire you know, modelers because we, we, we don't know what the road conditions are. You, you, you visually do it and have a set policy. So I don't, I don't want you to think it's unusual if you don't have that in place for really important things. And so you know, having, again, local officials doing the best job they can to maintain these systems, both for complete streets and for the system itself, I, I think that is what we're doing, and that's, that's why they're accountable to, to the voters in their districts. So again, I, 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 I just think it's an overreach potentially to, to try to do it. So, uh, you know, one thing I'm hearing is a uh, kind of a separation in your mind 
of regular maintenance versus complete streets. And I think the whole point about complete streets is that it should be part of what is regular, ongoing, what is needed, so that it's not an afterthought or something else that's costing us more, that it's part of what we, we do. Um, and, and that's, uh, I think, a challenge. Um, anything that's new, uh, is, and it's relatively new, um, is something that we're going to think of as, as something else that we have to do. Um, uh, what can the state do to improve that situation so that, in fact, the point of complete streets and whatever updating needs to be done becomes part of the, the business as usual, right? That it's a standard operating procedure. It's not something separate that we have to consider as an, an adjunct in some way that might enhance that perception of it costing more or whatever. How do we meld those things together? In, can, can I, in, 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 can I can put it this way from, from, I think, the town's perspective is um, the New York Bridge Program, which has gone three rounds, it's great. Right now, it's so oversubscribed, and mostly towns use culverts. So far, the application process, 13% of the culverts applied for funding have been funded. So 87%, there's no funding even in the program, and, and these, are, these are culverts that are failing. We, we have a, a third of our pavement system in fair and poor condition. So w what we're saying is we're trying to get across the message that our base system is failing. There is not enough resources there. And that 1.7 figure that we used in 2017, it's 2223 two, two, now before with just the inflation. Forget about what we just talked about with salt increase, you know, the ability to be able to hire people. It's trying to get across it. it everyone would want to do exactly what you're saying. But there's, there are some communities literally that can't use all their CHIPS money because they don't have $250,000 available for reimbursement purposes. There are communities in this state that are very poor, and, and they're not wanting not to do this. Can you imagine not having enough money that you can't even use a reimbursement program? But I think that's what we're trying to get that conversation going. Let's look at the big picture, not just this part of it. I think it's all woven together, and we need to look at it in that broad picture. Thank you. Ms. Davies. Thank you. Um, and uh, I, I uh, appreciate your testimony. I feel like I've, uh, we've learned a lot today, and it looks like uh, we have a lot of assignments going forward, particularly on the CHIPS funding. Um, but I also think that it, it sounds like there's a number of missed opportunities here. Um, and, and I want to echo the, the comments from some of my colleagues um, because I do think we need to do more with uh, resurfacing. And we've talked a lot about the safety uh, and how safety is paramount, but I, I can't help but think that it's the, the safety of the cars that are paramount as opposed to um, pedestrians or cyclists. And, and so part of, I think, this hearing and part of this urge for change is to make sure that we are talking about safety in a more broad way, uh, not just car safety, but safety of uh, the pedestrians and cyclists. And uh, while yes, some of it does increase costs, um, it's, uh, to me, I, um, in what I have seen around the state, I think um, it does take more creativity and that paint goes a long, long way. I understand that uh, there's also a problem of paint not being bondable, um, but that is a, a problem. Uh, just a couple of questions. Um, there was reference to the environment and resiliency, and uh, I know a year and a half ago under the previous governor, he had made the comment that we have spent over $50 billion just in state dollars on weather-related um, weather disasters. So I, I wasn't sure if that was a, a criticism um, of taking an environment and resiliency uh, costs as a part of the, um, the complete streets, and I wasn't sure if, uh, if you wanted to clarify that. The other question related to this is you mentioned, um, I heard mention of nine levels of roads. Are there certain levels of roads that you would um, recommend the, the full use of, of a mandatory complete streets review uh, as opposed to others, other than the, the dirt roads that were referenced? Yeah, I mean, we'd be happy to provide those to, um, to Julie and Craig, um, the analysis of, of what, they're, they're basically between the federal and state DOTs, um, how the local roads are broken out. And then they are all subcategorized through DOT. 
and, and I think there are good definitions within those. I, I can't tell you right now off the top of my head whether I think two of the nine should be part of it or five of the nine, but I, I think that's a, that's, that's a good starting point so that, that, that we're not you know, reinventing the wheel. A lot of this has been done and is understandable, and I think it's a good basis to have the conversation that we start with. Okay, that may be helpful to tailor some of this. Uh, if the, I could, the, I would add to that that painting with a broad brush, you're going to be looking more at urban, suburban, and some of the larger rural roads for most of the complete streets features. Uh, but again, that's a, that's a broad brush. Okay. I, I know in my own town and uh, some of the towns I represent, and we'll hear from one of them today, uh, it, it was um, very difficult to get them to, uh, not the town, but for the town to get support uh, while they were resurfacing to add in um, uh, the sidewalks and, uh, and wider roads for, um, for bike lanes. Uh, but we'll, we'll hear more about that. It, my last question is how, uh, in some of this, are you getting the support that you need from state DOT uh, and are there things that uh, we need to be looking at there? Our, we have a great relationship with our regional DOT, um, which is Region 6 out of Hornell. I'm sure most of the other towns and counties have very similar experiences. <coughs> They're a great resource for us for expertise, but just like counties and towns, the state can't print money either. So it, it does come down to there are no state resources to throw at this uh, very important issue. Uh, I come back again to that plan. If we have a plan in place, we can go after more federal dollars. And, and I think that's a win for everybody is to try to maximize the amount of federal dollars coming into New York. Thank you. Can, can I just okay. add one thing? And, and um, I'm from Warren County. And so our population this summer goes to about 250,000 from 50 normally. So we have a lot of folks in motels and in their summer places. We have a lot of lakes. And it, 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 just more of a public education, too, about people wearing bright, reflective gear when they're walking. Because you can have a three or four foot uh, uh, shoulder, but if, they're dark, if it's dark and it's a curvy road and you don't have reflective, any type of reflective uh, clothing on, you can't see them. And so it's really, I, I think they're just, like we do with bicyclists and others, we, we just, I, I, I just think it's really important because every time I go by somewhere, I, I want to just pull over and give them a reflective vest if I could. Because yeah. you, you it's very scary. And, and I think a lot of public education is important too. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Walsh. Uh, thanks, Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Avery and Mr. Haifa, thanks for your testimony today. And also, if you could please pass back to your membership. Uh, we know that they're having issues with, with staffing across the board. Uh, we know that there are great guys and gals out there in highway barns across this state that are getting the job done every single day. And uh, they're not just doing it for a paycheck. They are literally taking care of their, their towns, villages, and county roads every single day uh, to keep us all moving. Uh, I certainly don't take it granted when I drive here to Albany across town, village, county, and state roads. Um, so thank you for the 87% of the highways that you take care of for our state. On behalf of the citizens of the state of New York, I just feel like I needed to say that and please pass that along to your membership. So Mr. Avery, you mentioned federal dollars um, for hitting some of those checklist items for DOT complete streets. Uh, what, kind of, what kind of federal incentives are there for you to complete a complete streets program or project rather? We, we just completed a uh, our Water Street project in downtown Elmira, which was a federally aided project, so 80% federal, 15% you know, state March of Salt Lake funding. And, and any project that's federal like that, we do incorporate complete streets features. For example, on this, we had curb bump outs. So we had center medians. Um, and you may not think of this as complete streets, but it really is. We put in back in diagonal parking uh, in one area because if you're a cyclist coming down a road and a car is trying to back out into a lane, that's a recipe for getting hit. Uh, so having, being able to pull into the lane uh, is, is critical so that you can see if a cyclist is coming because they're not as visible, even with backup cameras that today's cars have, it's hard to see a cyclist coming down the road. 
Uh, so I, we are thinking about the people that are walking and biking uh, in addition to uh, the cars because uh, the easy statistic to put out there, if a child gets hit at 30 miles an hour, chances are they aren't going to survive. Uh, so we want to do whatever we can to ensure that one, the vehicles are going slower where they need to, uh, but two, we don't put a child in a position where they're going to get hit even at 30 miles an hour. Was that not to get into the nitty gritty, but I mean, this is pretty comprehensive and we're talking a lot about local governments and our, our um, interplay there and what our, our state lane to stay in uh, here is. Uh, so that project in Elmira, was that part of Elmira's comprehensive plan or master plan or was it driven from the planning side or did uh, the, the complete streets extras, all the, the great safety measures that you're talking about, did those come in as a result of federal policy uh, and 80% funding being available and then the city said, oh, we have a real opportunity to do some of these things here. Which, which direction did it go? Both. Um, it was certainly driven by the fact that we had access to federal dollars, uh, but that project came in about $600,000 over our estimate just because of timing and the city realized the importance of it and used their own money to pay for that. So I, I think there is a realization amongst uh, all the different political entities across the state that this is important. Uh, it's not everybody is equally positioned to take advantage of it though. Have, uh, have you and your experience, and I know you'll lead the county very well, or any of your colleagues, have you, have you seen projects out there that have had an incentive that sort of went unused? Like my colleague from Long Island was talking about uh, bike lanes that just haven't really been used. Maybe the planners or the consultants or when we put this project together, we just kind of missed it a little bit and the street was, I don't want to say more complete than it should have been, but there was a, an add-on that they just kind of missed the mark on. Have you seen any examples of that? I think in its quite germane to the example on Long Island is that bike lanes that aren't designed right, don't have separation, uh, aren't used. Uh, you risk getting hit by a car opening their door from a parked car. You, you risk the, the grit on the road. Uh, we need to do a better job designing the, the bike lanes so that they can be used and, and used uh, appropriately. Have you, have you seen any examples of something getting built that was completely, and, and you talked about Elmira's project, sort of tweaked off of the comprehensive plan of the city, maybe added a little bit to it. Have you seen any that were just, this wasn't a part of the master plan at all, but there were federal dollars available, so we said, you know what would be great for this project? Boom, bike lane on this road. Have you seen examples of that? Yeah, we've done that. Okay, you've, yes, you've seen it directly under... We've done it in Elmira, and sometimes... <clears throat> they get used and you know, sometimes they don't, but we're still trying to put opportunities there. Even if it's not used uh, all the time, you're trying to create opportunities. Uh, thanks very much. I, I don't know if you wanna, wanna chime in at all on the, on the town end. Have you seen any complete streets that have uh, well, I mean, it, gone outside of the... I, I think what you end up doing is like, like on 378, uh, which is in Colony, you've got um, a reconfiguring for really traffic calming. So you're, you're taking what was a 55 mile an hour four, uh, four lane, two directions highway, you're taking down to one lane making 45 miles an hour, and then they have a bike slash walk lane. It, 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 as Andy was saying, I don't want to walk or ride next to 45 mile an hour live traffic. It takes one person looking at a cell phone for a second and whap. So, you know, those type of standards are incredibly important for usage. They're incredibly important for safety, and there's a, there's, a, there's a place. I mean, absolutely, we need to have both, but you need to do it in a safe way, not just so you can say you did it because there was funds available and I went and spent the money. Thanks. I just want to conclude. So, Mr. Avery, I'm also a cyclist. Uh, right now, the city of Watertown, I, I live on a block that has a bike shop. Uh, that is utilizing complete streets that we passed when I was on the Watertown City Council. They're doing uh, back-end uh, parking on a street that has been a one-way with parking in the opposite direction. Um, it's awesome. It also fits directly into the comprehensive plan that uh, the city has put forward in, for a long time. Um, but Chairman, I, I would say, and this is one of, the, one of the biggest, I won't occupy a lot of the microphone today, 
uh, one of the biggest points that I want to make is that the elected officials, the planners, the engineers, the highway supers uh, that do this job every single day, they're the ones that have to have the buy-in, and, and they're really getting there. They understand the principles of complete streets. They also need to be the driving force of the policy. Because when we incentivize, whether it's at the federal level, and say we're going to 80 fund, we're going to 80 percent fund this program as long as you check all of these blocks. Well, guess what? Then all of the handicap ramps you ever wanted or didn't want on that road, they're going to get there, and all of the bike lanes that you wanted magically, they're going to appear. Because when you attach dollars to it, you'll incentivize that thing. But it needs to be driven not from the dollars from on high from Washington or here but from what our town highway superintendents, what our county highway superintendents, what our village DPW um, leaders are saying, and what those, the planners and comprehensive plans have, have laid out in all of our municipalities that handle 87% of the roads in the state of New York. So with that, uh, thank you for your testimony. And thanks for the time, Chairman. All right. Um, I still think it's the dollars that matter. You can't do it without the dollars, no matter who wants it. And so I disagree with you a little bit on that one, Mr. Walzik. Um, let, me, uh, let me say thank you to you for your testimony. I don't think there's any other questions at this point in time. Um, and I really do appreciate your testimony this morning. I think it was, it, it was helpful to me, if, and I'm sure the other members as well. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. You're welcome. Okay. We're going to move on to Mr. Jeff Olson, Vice President of Connectivity, uh, regarding Charge E. Hello Good morning. Thanks. Good morning, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, sure. It's a very important session to have going on. You know. um, I'm going to start off personally saying, though, that I was hit by a motorist uh, just about a week and a half ago in broad daylight. Um, I'm very fortunate to be sitting here today. Uh, yeah. I followed that with a week-long ride across New York State on the Empire State Trail, so I'm pretty happy about that. But you know, both of those things happening in a 10-day span is, is very interesting, especially as we're sitting here today. Um, by way of background, I ran New York State's Bicycle and Pedestrian Program for State DOT in the 1990s. Um, I was principal of the firm Alta Planning and Design and have worked on complete streets projects across the state and around the world. Um, I was one of the co-founders of City Bike. Very happy that that's been uh, the success that it continues to be. Um, I also was a faculty member at UAlbany for more than 20 years teaching a course on bicycle and pedestrian transportation. That was the first of its kind uh, in the United States. Um, currently involved in a, a local company startup that's uh, developing wireless charging for e-bikes and scooters uh, called Recharge. And um, all this kind of brings me to you know, the Complete Streets legislation. And I hope that my perspective from that experience is useful. Um, um, and certainly with tremendous respect to the, mem the members of families that are here who have suffered losses and injuries um, due to the conditions uh, of, of the roads in our state and the drivers who, uh, who drive on them. Um, I'm going to paraphrase my testimony, which was submitted um, earlier in the interest of time, and just focus on a couple of the key points here. Um, I certainly believe that we need to change and to or. Um, because there are very few projects where we use both state and federal funding. Um, those are the rarities and, and the comments earlier about trying to make this the way that we do business so that it is a part of every single project. Um, I do understand very much firsthand um, from decades of work in this field um, that on every single road and street there is a way to make complete streets happen from the most rural to the most urban. Um, in fact, my firm wrote many of the guidelines that are available for use, uh, including the NACTO guide, um, and I would say co-wrote, and actually co-worked on everything I've mentioned in my career. I'm one of many and part of a team that did that work. I never want that credit myself, but 
Um, certainly the NACTO guide has become uh, sort of a household word. Um, we also wrote the SMART guide for uh, rural communities to use complete streets with the Federal Highway Administration. So the tools are out there, and it's a matter of context sensitive response on a case by case basis. But you know, even a gravel road, if you ride uh, uh, and, and ride distances, gravel biking has become a very popular thing right now, and those gravel roads are a treasure. Um, so there is a complete streets element for even the most rural roads that are out there. Um, I do think, secondly, that we uh, have 10 points, I'm gonna go through them quickly, that some set of annual reporting um, scorecard, if you will, that shows not just from the state DOT, but from the partner agencies, from metropolitan planning organizations, cities, villages, towns, um, so that we can see what progress is being made, what percentage of projects are achieving these goals, how does that tie to our safety goals, how does it charge to our, tie to our mode share goals? We should be increasing the number of people walking and bicycling um, and at the same time making those modes of travel safer. Um, third, I, I feel there needs to be a very strong effort on main streets when we talk about complete streets. There are uh, more than 180 of them on the state uh, highway system uh, in the state. Um, and every one of them needs to be made safer for people walking and bicycling. Those, those people are the customers of these communities. I've just ridden through a whole bunch of them uh, across the state. Uh, some of them are doing some amazing things. Some of them you still feel like some improvements could be made, um, but an emphasis that really targets those Main Street towns um, as the, uh, Main Streets in towns as the center of their economic development. Um, fourth, and I, I think there have been some conversations previous that we need to clarify the right of way in New York State law. There are issues that still exist. The, the term greenway or shared use path or multi-use trail still does not exist in the vehicle and traffic law, which is why we still have challenges being able to fund and make these things happen. Um, it's still unclear whether, say, on the Empire State Trail, someone crossing a road on the trail while they're riding a bike has the right of way in the crosswalk. And that became a design issue in that project. Uh, we need to sort of catch up with uh, contemporary issues with, with our uh, longstanding state laws. Um, I'm gonna keep going fairly quickly. Um, I think we need to elevate the state's bike and pedestrian program um, as a former incumbent from that position um, at the time that, um, that I was involved. We had tremendous support from the very top. Um, uh, John Egan, commissioner, many of you may remember, was an incredible leader, and Lou Rossi, who's memorialized here on the Albany waterfront, and others that, that made that program a very significant, visible part of what we do. When you go to other states, the bike and pedestrian program's on the org chart. When you walk into their building, it's part of what they do. Here, I would challenge people to even find where that program exists and who's running it. Um, it's been very quiet for a long period of time. Um, so I think that needs to really take a step up. When we look at other states around us, Massachusetts being a good example, was ranked the number one state uh, uh, for, for bike, uh, biking at the state level. Um, New York State is not at the top of the list, and I really, I think we should be. Um, so let's, let's reach that level by by looking what other states have done, Massachusetts, Oregon, Colorado, et cetera. Um, number six is that I think we need to connect what we're talking about with complete streets to our state's efforts on climate change. Um, I've been listening to those task force meetings and, and participating in them, and uh, all the transportation conversation misses the sort of green infrastructure that we need for walking and biking. Uh, we tend to talk very much about electric cars, um, but we don't tend to talk as much about electric bikes and scooters. Uh, we tend to talk about, and in addition to electric bikes and scooters, I'd say acoustic uh, bikes and scooters and people walking are just as important. Uh, we can reach a significant percentage of our climate change goals uh, with a greater emphasis on, on walking and bicycling. Um, number seven is, is ensure that funding is equitable. We've heard a lot of conversation already today about the concerns about how, how investments get made. Um, Part of the challenge is that we're looking often at the wrong end of the telescope. We're, we're looking at the walking and bicycling as the last thing that we do after we've already done a project. We're not looking at roadway conditions and saying, well, what if the walking and bicycling things are missing entirely? Shouldn't that initiate a project? We shouldn't just be waiting until the pavement is worn out from a motorist perspective to be able to start to make things happen. Uh, that funding equity is absolutely essential, especially when we look at our, our state's pedestrian and bicycle safety uh, issue which continues uh, to this day in spite of all the efforts that are being done. Um, I'll go through the last couple here. Um, number eight, the, uh, the statewide plan and our design manuals are, are far out of date. 
1997 uh, statewide bicycle and pedestrian plan, um, I, I wrote it uh, when I worked for the department. We did that with a statewide advisory council that reported to the governor. I don't think that advisory council has met since that time. Mm. Um, and really, you know, those are the kinds of things that when we look at why Massachusetts is doing all the things that they're doing, we should be doing the same. As I mentioned, the design manual um, very much needs to include the NACTO guide, needs to include the, the SMART guidelines that were done with Federal Highway for rural communities, and to bring our, our design level up to uh, what is out there and, and take advantage of that. Um, number nine, I think we need to rethink our performance measures of what we're considering for our roadways and streets. Everything from the way we measure congestion of traffic and a reminder that the word traffic in New York State law starts with the word pedestrian. Uh, it doesn't often start that way in practice. Um, we need to look at pavement scoring from the perspective of a person riding a bike or a person walking across that street. Um, the analogy I, I've always tried to use is that you know, imagine that it's your mother pushing your child in a stroller across the street. If it's good enough for that, then it's definitely done right. Until that time, it's not. And the last one, and I'm gonna wanna end with a positive, I guess that's my nature, is that we need to share New York State's successes. I mean, I, I can't tell you, last week riding the Empire State Trail, what a joy it was. Uh, having been involved in the project is one part of it, but um, seeing it done and seeing what communities have accomplished is just extraordinary. Uh, I was able to do the Hudson Valley section after riding the Five Borough Tour back in May and uh, rode all the way to my house in Saratoga from Battery Park. And um, it's, it's inspiring. What we're doing is incredible. And I, I know these comments may in part sound critical. I hope that their intent, their intent is to be constructive. Um, I think this is the greatest state in the country. I think it's one of the, I live here because this is one of the best places in the world. Um, and I fully believe that. My, our new company that we're working on, I hope proves that point that things like that can happen here. But they need the legislature's help and we need to remove the challenges that, that make uh, things that otherwise seem easy seem more difficult than they should be. Um, and that's, that's really what we're here to talk about today is how to, how to take this legislation and make it stronger so that our state can, can continue to be the empire state. So. Um, uh, that's going to be my 10 minutes of fame for today. I'll, I'll respond to questions if you want, but I want to thank you for doing this, and I, I do appreciate the work that's done at the local level, the counties, you know, all the people out there that, um, you know, some of the most dangerous jobs in any industry are people working on our, on our roads. Uh, it's also, one, unfortunately, a dangerous place to be, and I'm speaking from personal experience um, uh, just in the last couple of weeks, and uh, that's not the only time that's happened. So. We need to make those problems um, much less frequent and make the joy of people being out there enjoying our state uh, what we think of more often. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome and thank you very much for testifying this morning. And um, I'm almost done reading your book, The Third Bode. It's old. It's not that old. It's good bedtime reading, I think. Uh, yeah, well. Yes, <laughs> as a matter of fact, it is. Um, but it also talks about what others have talked about today. I think uh, Member Fahey was alluding to it, you know, thinking in a different way and thinking outside of the box is, is always said, but this is like thinking of another solution that nobody has ever even thought about. So. Um, I, I commend you on that. It's given me a lot of food for thought. Um, I'm, I'm still focusing in on, you know, you say we make things stronger, uh, make the law stronger to push things forward. But I, I, I can't help myself, you know? It might be my age, I don't know. But uh, what's doable is what I need to know. I mean. And how do I get it started? It's, it, it's what we said at the beginning of this hearing. I think most people are in agreement that they would like to do these things and that complete streets uh, are going to be done as we go forward. What is doable now? What do I do now? Is there, with your experience, can you give me any insight into that? Yeah, I, and I, I'm going to use one example, and it's actually a chapter in the book where I talked about the change in the pedestrian law uh, yeah. that um, made it easier to post signs that would say yield to pedestrians. Um, that battle took seven years 
um, from the time it was first initiated um, to be able to go f a tremendous opposition within the department that I worked for, um, for, for largely because the legislation was vague in the way it described that, that, that pedestrian's right of way to cross the road. Just that simple change, though, then allowed yield to pedestrian signs to be put up all over the state. And that starts to shift motorist behavior. It starts to, it doesn't always work yet. We're still not at the levels of compliance. But, so I think there are a lot of very low cost, doable things that I think part of it is a, maybe a better understanding using the design tools that are out there now so that this concern that complete streets are always more expensive starts to go away. There is a way to do these things in a cost effective within the context of projects that are already happening and I think dispelling that myth that this automatically costs more every time we do something, I think goes a long way to starting to get, we just said a few minutes ago, that buy-in from the leadership on the ground that are making these projects happen. So they're not responding and this is always gonna cost more no matter what we do. So I think that's a big change right there. But what you're talking about is doing things, when we think of complete streets, I think the layperson, someone not involved in this on a daily basis, they're thinking of putting in the sidewalks, the right. bike lanes, the bus lanes, the paint on the, but what you're talking about is that every time we do a street, how do we make it better for everybody? Right. What, is, what can we add that will make it better? And that not, is not necessarily putting down more pavement, pavement and sidewalks, et cetera, et cetera, but just make it better tomorrow than it was today. Yeah, and I, there's a good example. It's about, I live in Saratoga Springs. We've got some of our folks here today. Um, mm -hmm. A good example, Union Avenue in front of the thoroughbred track in Saratoga, pretty well-known location. Um, historically, had stone dust side paths adjacent to the road and paved shoulders. If we go back and retrofit those and just improve the stone dust paths, that's a very low cost, but very valuable improvement in my opinion. But there's a different school of thought saying we have to put in curbs and drainage and sidewalks to make that project successful. If we do that, the cost is gonna be significantly different, right? Right, right? So, and then there's people saying, well, stone dust doesn't meet the ADA, but that, you know, differences like that are the difference between delivering a project that, that is very, very good and a project that might be perfect. Um, and those differences are significant financially. I think clarifying in the design world that, um, that engineers and designers know that these are the range of options that are available goes a long way to, to saving us a lot of money, to still getting a lot accomplished, and may be able to spread more of that. The, the sign and stripe projects, the, the low cost things, reallocation of dimensions on the pavement, most of the time can be accomplished in any, even in resurfacing projects. If, if it's made known that when you're resurfacing, you're not gonna have to add curb and drainage every single time. I think your comment about, you know, the layperson sense is complete streets mean we have to build sidewalks every, on every road in the state, including the gravel roads. I think that's, there's a lot of that belief out there and that causes the misperception that, that complete streets are automatically more expensive. Okay. Well, I thank you for your testimony. Ms. Barrett, then Ms. Fahey, okay. Hi, thank you, Jeff, and um, thank you so much for your help. And we were drafting our bill, speaking to you initially gave me a whole new way, as you have today um, brought forward to think about all this. And I'd like to go back to um, what we were saying about uh, where, where bikes fit into our, um, our policy and our, our uh, governance here. What's that about and how do we go forward with that? Because I think that was originally what, you know, how we came to you, how I came to you, because I wanted to fund a bike path in my district through with transportation money, and they said, no, no, that's not multimodal, we can't do that. And it was like, well, if we're trying to get people to use bikes and use them safely and be able to use them as transportation, then how do we not consider them transportation? So can you talk about how we, um, I mean, given all your time spent in, in the DOT and your work in these other areas, how do we how do we move beyond that? What's what's a game plan for that? Well, our, our laws go back to you know horse and carriage era in New York State, that, and horses are still mentioned in the vehicle and traffic law. So um, they we go got back horses to too in my district. <laughs> yeah, uh, now this really the, we're dealing with laws that have been written over a very long period of time, and I think the question is you know, as we've seen um, a fairly fairly significant shift in people recognizing that walking and bicycling 
are both transportation and rec recreation, that they are their mobility. And I think we're finally getting to that point. We're still dealing with terms and law or the lack thereof uh, that, that makes some of those things really challenging. And the, the one that I was using before is that the pedestrian cross, crossings law all sort of predate that. So the idea of a bicyclist on a greenway or a shared use path using the crosswalk that crosses a road, that condition doesn't exist in law. So you know they're, they're fairly simple codifications, I guess, of the way current practice is. And each one of them solves another problem. I, um, we went through that issue in dozens of places. The Empire State Trail is a great example where by not being able to say that bicyclists had the same right as a pedestrian to use a crossing on a shared use path to cross a road, we had lots of places where there were local communities and engineers telling us, you gotta put up signs that say, dismount your bike. Um, many of the signs on the trail still have stop signs facing for people coming on the trail when you cross a very small farm road in a rural area. But the right-of-way should be assigned the other way. The way right-of-way is correctly done is the higher volume facility would have the right-of-way. The stop sign should be for the tractor crossing the path. That only happens once a day or, or, or a couple times a day. There are thousands of people on the path going by. So it's a matter of each one of those things, and there's sort of a, a probably a longer list of them, makes these other decisions so much easier to happen because they are then, in fact, supported by the law. So you know, my recommendation uh, as such would be to, to go back and find, and we talked about this a while ago, find those small, they're almost technical corrections. They're not major changes. They're just clarifying that th these are things that now exist. Uh, the, the huge growth of the greenways and trails movement, the Empire State Trail wasn't here four years ago. Um, and, and thanks to everyone who made that possible, especially during the pandemic, um, we're seeing more of that. So that use is increasing. Literally millions of people are out there. They need to be supported by, by law and the engineers and designers working on other projects, learn from that experience, let's not repeat it, let's make sure we've clarified those things and, and support all forms of transportation in, in the way that's appropriate. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Uh, yes, uh, thank yes. you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, thank you, Jeff, for being here. You're, um, quite frankly, you're a legend in this uh, area and really appreciate the, the groundwork that, that you have laid. And I, too, have taken the Erie Canal and very proud of the work we've done on the Empire State Trail. And, um, but you mentioned parks and DOT. And I think that's, you know, maybe part of the problem here, too. And we've just run into uh, barrier after barrier uh, in terms of getting things funded and, and, uh, and passed. But how do we cross this, this uh, divide, if you will, where um, so many of these issues are still considered recreation instead of serious transportation issues? And, you know, even the Empire Trail, that was all done through parks. And again, I just saw Andy Beers a week ago and commended him again for the extraordinary work. It was record time, but I, uh, it, there's a real divide, um, and and there is a desperate need for a change in the mindset. Uh, any recommendations on on that, on how we get DOT to um, uh, prioritize this in the same way? And I saw your your comments. I, I see your comments about the advisory committee, but in addition to. This, this funding issue on, um, on a number of these matters. Yeah, I think that's the advisory council idea, which worked well when we did the plan in the 1990s. Um, that tool has worked in so many places where it cuts across the stovepipes of different agencies and gets people you know, working collaboratively across those, those boundaries. And it, it's not just parks and, and DOT, but DEC, economic development, you know, all the things that we need to do to make that happen. Um, that advisory council included the state and local highway superintendents uh, uh, organizations as well, conference of mayors. Um, you know, this is, none of this stuff gets done by any one of the agencies or organizations working in isolation. These are all projects that require multiple levels of cooperation. Whether we could get that to be a governor's level effort again, I certainly hope we could. I mean, it, it does, support the initiatives that are happening at so many different levels. So the idea that you could have a, um, an approach to environmental issues that addresses climate change by reducing our carbon footprint, that also helps by improving health and public safety, 
and at the same time improves tourism and economic development, walking and bicycling do all those things at very low cost with very high benefit. I think that's really why we're here trying to make these things happen. So I think setting up a structure where whether that's done by executive order or just by practice, um, you know, it, it might not necessarily take a formal appointments process to, to run an entity like that. It just takes leadership within the agencies willing to come together and do it. And I think that's you know, what we're not seeing right now. We are seeing these things happen independently from each other, and yet there's this great expertise in every one of those subject matter areas, from the local to the state, private sector involvement as well, that, that we're not capitalizing on. So I, to me, I, I think it's a combination of uh, whether it's a formal process, the, the real need is to just cut across those stovepipes. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Simon? Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, so I'm from Brooklyn, where like the streetscape is very different <laughs> from a lot of other places. Um, and I noticed that you're currently working with this e-charge or chargee. And uh, one of the issues that we're struggling with is the, all these various electronic vehicles. They're e-bikes, but then there are the bikes that are not really quite bikes. And then there are the things that are somewhere in between a moped and an e-bike, um, not to mention the all-terrain vehicles that are zooming in and out sometimes. Um, and it strikes me that it's not clear in the law uh, what rights these different levels of, of uh, e-bike, for lack of a better term, have. Uh, we have a lot of e-bikes on sidewalks, for example, um, and in the bike lanes. And some of the ones that are really not bicycles really don't belong in the bike lanes. Do you have um, uh, information on that that we could use to guide us in sort of analyzing that and because it seems to me every week there's another kind of e-bike technology coming out with a slightly different model that does something a little different um, and it's I get calls all the time not just from uh, seniors but from increasingly from parents with school children who are afraid to cross the streets because of the e-bikes um, uh, but we of course need the e-bikes for, for various other uh, it's transportation for many people, for example. Um, so if you could uh, share some sure. enlightenment I, with me. It's an it's a interesting topic because you know, when you look at New York City's shift to a 25 mile an hour citywide speed limit, that probably came closer than anything to creating some level of, of parity. Mm -hmm. um, the big difference, whether it's between uh, motorists in relation to pedestrians and to the bicyclists, you know, anytime that speed relationship starts to double or triple the slower moving thing, the chances of something going wrong increase, right? So I think New York City has taken a huge step, and I hope other upstate cities will as well, in lowering citywide speed limits to begin with. Um, I feel very strongly, and I've said this my whole life, that it's pedestrians first and everything else after that. <laughs> Um, you know, if we can get the pedestrian safety right, we can really make everything else work. So it's that relationship of speed to pe from a pedestrian's walking speed or someone in a wheelchair or pushing a stroller speed up to the next things that move. How do we keep them in relationship to each other? So certainly non-throttled uh, electric, small electrics, uh, things like uh, pedal-assisted bikes like you'd see with City Bike now, um, as long as they're traveling at a speed under 20 miles an hour, they're likely to be compatible with that pedestrian use, right? Um, and that's a speed somebody on a pedaled bicycle can go if they're, if they're moving quickly. Um, right. Generally, if we can keep that close, that means we're not gonna have higher powered throttled vehicles that aren't being pedaled that can greatly outpace that speed. Um, at the same time, those vehicles are gonna exist and there's a right place for them. And the question really starts to become how do we reimagine the public realm so that paths, sidewalks, streets, road shoulders, you know, all those different things have the appropriate use of vehicles on them. And right now we don't. I think it's pretty clear. And I spent a lot of time in the city. And um, if I can still say that, the city, that's an old term. But um, I think folks here know what I mean. Um, and it's, yeah, everything is one wheels. There's uh, long boards. There's I mean, there are a million different things. And it's going to keep happening. Uh, we are going to see the electrification of, of mobility in interesting ways. 
and it has tremendous positives. And I think the hard part is not throwing the baby out with the bathwater because e-bikes and scooters are going to make it possible for people who don't have access to electric cars to travel in ways that uh, really open up a lot of opportunities uh, in our communities. For every electric car that gets charged, we can charge 200 bikes or scooters. That's a that's a pretty significant amount uh, uh, way of looking at that that use of energy uh, and use of mobility. So I think it's really just manage the, the the key thing for me is managing speed and the speed of things in relationship to one another. I do think that the ability to have speed limits citywide at a lower level makes a big help. Uh, the redesign of the infrastructure is going to evolve, and we're going to see. Um, the need to make sure that that it, it adapts to the range of vehicles that are that are happening out there. So, complicated question with being dealt with in real time. As far as resources for that, there are quite a few really good ones out there. NACTO has published some very recently. Uh, People for Bikes, uh, U.S. Department of Transportation, actually has put some good stuff out. And um, after the meeting, I'll I'll email some of those links. Thank you, because it, you know the industry is responding. Uh, in so many different ways, and I think it's just very difficult for people to figure out which is which and what we should be doing as a matter of policy yeah. in terms of where some of these vehicles should be. Um, and one, I just and, a plug yeah. for the bike industry in this country that has pledged that um, all the batteries and all the electric bikes sold in the United States will be recycled, and that's uh, good to hear that. That's so these are the kinds of things that if we all work together, we can really make people safer and more <laughs> mobile, which is what we're trying to do. Thank you. I have. I just want to go back to one question, if I may. Okay, you you talk about uh, changing and to or, because I'm dealing with as chair of this committee. I'm dealing with a couple of pieces of legislation that are of concern to me, and I know they're of concern to the authors of those pieces of legislation. Are there any other specs that could be used with that instead of if I change, I if we change, excuse me we change the law the way it's proposed, then everything becomes subject to some kind of a report, analysis, or inspection for complete streets. What we heard a little bit earlier is that that could be additional monies that could be used in making complete streets. I mean, because there's going to be a lot of them that are going to fall off the table, so to speak. So are there any other specs that we should be looking at? Any other, like the classifications of roads? I mean, are these things we should be looking at or not looking at? I, I think yes. And I, I think the, the example I used earlier, um, the smart guide for rural and small towns um, that was developed specifically for USDOT to address those non-urban conditions of complete streets so that rural roads could be handled in a way that was compatible with the idea. Now, take your typical rural road in New York State where right away is limited, but we still can manage speed. Um, we may not be able to change the configuration of lanes, but we might be able to change where the striping is. What are those low-cost, doable things? We might be able to find where our gravel roads are and promote them for tourism <laughs> because they're, they're, people are out gravel biking now. It's become a phenomenon, right? So if we, I think the more we could clarify that range as being okay, that, that if people really knew that there is a way to make this a, quote, complete street without building sidewalks, without, that there are other alternatives that fit the context of those, of those places, I think that by itself will help um, as a tool that, that's not being used enough. I think all mm -hmm. too often the response is that we can't do this because it, it's going to cost more money. I think the, the and and or piece is very similar to should and shall in, in complete streets policies. And um, I know uh, Justin is here from Buffalo and hopefully we'll talk a little bit about you know, the difference between them having should um, in, in the policy that got ad adopted in Buffalo and shall, which is what they had, which is we are doing this, we will do this. And at the same time, what we're going to do is not the most costly thing on every single project. We're going to have the engineering judgment, the design skill to apply that in a way that's appropriate without breaking the bank. And I think that's the hard part, is how do you uh, achieve that, that combination of, uh, again, you know, New York City, one simple thing, changing the speed limit to 25 miles an hour, 
helped every street in the city, didn't necessarily cost money, made a major change happen. So, um, and thanks to transportation alternatives uh, for, for making that possible. Um, I think that's, that's the balance, is between the tools that are in the toolbox, the ability to use them, having them codified in law, and at the same time having that, yes, this is what we are going to do. It's not, the language is clear and direct that yes, this, we are doing this. Okay. okay. So, but, but how do I get there? That's, I'm, I'm still yeah. getting a mental block on this. What does a town, for example, have to do? Does it have to hire an engineer to say, yes, this is needed, or no, it's not needed? Can it be done in-house? Is the town a highway supervisor enough with his crew or whatever it is? And every town is different and has different kinds of uh, expertise, I'm sure. Right. Um, how, again, any insight into something? Yeah, and I think that's, I don't think there's going to be a way that from a specific piece of legislation that that can get done right everywhere simultaneously. Hmm. Um, I think that the law as it's been in place has helped us move forward. The enhancements to the law will, will take some time to get there. Um, I think there has to be some way that the way the law is written provides enough guidance and the way the agencies take up that guidance and deliver it makes it possible for all that to work. Um, but the challenge being the range and difference between New York City and Saratoga Springs and Buffalo and, and right. all the small towns in between. But I still think that it does need to be our state's law and our policy that this is what we're going to do. So it's going to take some more time to think through that. I'm not sure I'm easily enough giving a direct answer to your, to your question. Well, I may be calling you. I, and I was going to say I'm, <laughs> I'm willing to help think about this some more okay. after today. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Anything else, folks? Thank you. Glad you appreciate it. And again, yes. thanks to all the folks behind me here, who, yep. um, or, and to all of you for making all this possible. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Kenneth Kowalczyk, town planner for the town of Gilderland. Go right ahead, sir. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Chairman Magnarelli, members of the committee. I appreciate and honor of being here today and speaking on behalf of the town of Gilderland. I also appreciate the, the speakers thus far. Um, it really will provide context to what the focus of my testimony will be today, and that is focusing on opposition that planners are seeing at the local level with trying to implement com complete streets. And you're going to kind of put this long. <laughs> I am not going to read this verbatim. Okay, I'm going good. to summarize. We, we will take it up, I promise you. But I'm going to summarize. I know there's other people out yep. there who'd like to get home tonight. Yep. Um, I'm going to summarize. Uh, for the record, I, I did um, submit a 16-page memorandum to the committee along with yep. three, three exhibits. And thank you. Um, I'd like to just start off briefly with some statistics. Uh, which I think speak to the heart of what you're going to be hearing today and what you have heard today. And that is the Governor's Highway Safety uh, Association saw a double-digit percentage increase in the first six months of 2021 versus 2020 for pedestrian deaths. Here in New York State, New York State we saw a 30% increase in pedestrian fatalities in the first six months of 2021 compared to the same time period in 2020. 39 states have experienced increases in pedestrian deaths in the first six months of 2021 as compared to the same time period in 2020. Those statistics are important because the GHSA blamed this on four reasons. Speeding, distracted driving, larger vehicles, and roads that prioritize car drivers over everyone else. I believe three of those four criteria are precisely why we're here today and why this committee is hearing testimony related to speeding, distracted driving, and roads that pri prioritize car drivers over everybody else. That speaks to the heart of trying to implement complete streets in New York State. 
At the local level, planners face a number of challenges with implementing complete streets. As planners, it is our task to guide our local boards, whether that be town boards, planning boards, city councils, throughout the state, guiding them through the local land use process and promoting and implementing complete streets policies. I'd like to highlight eight of the challenges that we face. First and foremost is the public opposition to projects incorporating complete streets. Since 2019, the town of Gilderland has been trying to implement three major development projects adjacent to Crossgates Mall on property that's owned by the Pyramid Corporation, owner of Crossgates Mall. I included those three project sites in Exhibit 1 to this committee. This was a project that our planning board felt would have cumulative impacts to the surrounding neighborhoods, which is why we spent over one year assessing the environmental impacts of these projects, with traffic safety being a fundamental importance and critical part of the review of those studies. For three of the sites that were analyzed, one was a multiple family residence uh, consisting of 222 apartments. The second was a proposed Costco. And then the third site was a mixed use development site consisting of apartments, office, and retail. I'd like to highlight some of the complete streets elements as part of that project associated with the apartment project, which is shown in exhibit one, which is located on Rapp Road, which is a major connecting road, if you're familiar with Gilliland, between Western Avenue and Washington Avenue Extension. That road travels through both roads in the town of Gilderland and in the city of Albany. On the northern end of Rapp Road is the Rapp Road Historic District, which is a very well-known historic district. Uh, it's, it's a black community that came from Mississippi up in the early 1900s and ended up um, locating in this part of the city in Albany, and it's on the National Register of Historic Places. So there was an attempt by the town of Gilderland to reduce and mitigate traffic impacts, not only on the Gilderland side, but also on the city of Albany side. With that, as you can see in the exhibit on uh, exhibit two that I submitted, the town of Gilderland took extreme measures to realigning Rapp Road, to installing multi-use trails and sidewalks, all with the intent of mitigating traffic through these existing residential neighborhoods with what we anticipated to be impacts from this um, residential uh, apartment community that was proposed. During this process, we did receive um, a lot of opposition um, from both the Albany County Planning Board, the City of Albany, uh, from a number of adjacent uh, residential neighborhoods, even with the implementing of these traffic mitigation alternatives. So much so that the 58-page finding statement that the Town Planning Board adopted as part of our environmental <coughs> impact statement, which specifically discussed the complete street measures and traffic mitigation for that project, we were still sued in New York State Supreme Court via an Article 78. So we had to defend that, fortunately, successfully. Um, but that just goes to show you that even when you propose these type of complete streets mitigation alternatives associated with development, there is still opposition to that. The second project site associated with the environmental impact statement is associated with the Costco. This again was a very contentious project. It is a project that has not received approval yet, but will um, be required to obtain a special use permit approval uh, with our zoning boards of appeals. The town of Gilderland has had a very uh, long and uh, positive relationship with DOT. They were involved with this project um, as part of the mitigation measures for the proposed Costco. They recommended the installation of a roundabout where I-87 exits, exits directly into Crossgates Mall uh, where the J.C. Penney is. The reason why DOT recommended that was because that intersection experiences 20 times the national average of accidents at that, inter at that intersection. So the roundabout is a very important piece of mitigating traffic impacts. So much so that 
as part of the adoption of the environmental impact statement, our planning board stated that Costco cannot open for business until that roundabout is operational. That's expected to be operational sometime in the summer of 2023. In addition to the roundabout, as you will see in exhibit three, there is extensive complete streets implementation on both Crossgates Mall Road and Rapp Road. Crossgates Mall Road and Rapp Road are both town roads. They're existing four lane roads with the implementation of these complete streets measures, we are reducing those lanes from four lanes to two lanes. You have dedicated turn lanes at each of the major in intersections. You'll have increased uh, crosswalks with pedestrian push button signals at each of those intersections. And then there's also similar to the site one apartment community, there will be additional multi-use trails and sidewalks installed associated with the Costco development. The total Linear feet for sidewalks for both site one and site two was roughly 2,000 feet of linear sidewalks. And uh, with the Costco, there's approximately 5,000 linear feet of 10 foot wide multi use trail that is required as part of these developments. This is an example of how development sometimes has to be used to incorporate <coughs> complete streets initiatives at the local level. But even with these complete streets elements being proposed with these projects, we still see uh, a lot of opposition for trying to implement these safety measures. Similarly, um, the Costco was included as part of that environmental impact statement um, and was included as part of the Article 78 lawsuits that I previously mentioned. Fortunately, the, the town was successful in moving these uh, projects forward, but it shows you that even when you try to correct an intersection with the 20 times national average accident history, there's still opposition to trying to implement these projects. The second example I'd like to provide is with a project that happened in the town of Bethlehem. As background, I was senior planner in the town of Bethlehem from 2013 to 2018. Uh, this was a project called the Delaware Avenue Complete Streets Project. The issue that the town of Bethlehem uh, was having was on um, Delaware Avenue, which is a state highway. It's also known as New York State Route 443. Um, there was a 1.3 mile stretch of the highway that between 2011 and 2015, there were 213 crashes on this section of roadway. Additionally, on the western end of the study corridor is the Ellesmere Elementary School. The crossing guard was hit twice uh, performing her duties as a crossing guard at the western end of this intersection. Additionally, when I was at the town of Bethlehem, I was the coordinator for the town's bicycle and pedestrian committee. As a prelude to this project, we reached out to the Ellesmere El Elementary School and conducted our own research to get an understanding of how many students are biking and walking to this school, um, which is the number is high which is why the town of Bethlehem supported implementing complete streets on this section of roadway. The issues we ran into was there was both positive and negative feedback from business owners and residents along this corridor. You had business owners who supported the complete streets because they were hearing from their customers how difficult it was making left turns into and out of their businesses. You had business owners objecting to the complete streets initiative because the feasibility indicated there may be one to two percent of traffic that seeks an alternative route once the study is implemented. They perceive that as business being taken away from them. This also became very political at the local level with the business owners in opposition hiring a public relations firm and the town of Bethlehem felt that the public relations firm and business owners were presenting misleading information to the public. The business owners in support of the project felt they couldn't meet the match of that opposition based on their, the public relations firm. Throughout this process, DOT was very involved. Uh, DOT actually provided about $1.5 million um, to this project, it was a total $5.2 million project. This speaks to the heart as well as a $5 million project to try to implement complete streets on a 1.3 mile stretch of roadway. 
The result of this project was because there was state and federal funding, it was subject to a permissive referendum. And in November of 2021, the voters of Bethlehem voted down this project. I did speak with Robert Leslie. He's the Director of Planning and Economic Development at Bethlehem, based on the testimony I provided here today. Um, one of the things that he stated to me that he felt DOT could have been better at during this process was publicly advocating for it. DOT did attend a number of meetings, um, but they really didn't speak in favor of the project. They weren't promoting it. Um, and I stated in here that this seems to be in contradiction to DOT's own public involvement manual, which directs them on how to communicate uh, and respond to um, being involved at public meetings. So that was one thing that the town of Bethlehem felt DOT could have been better for this project. I use these two projects as examples because with the projects happening around Crossgates Mall, that shows you the public opposition that we're dealing with when we try to implement projects associated with development. The town of Bethlehem project speaks directly to a local community trying to implement a grant funded project. In both instances, um, the public opposition was um, very loud uh, to the point, um, as I mentioned, uh, we had to fight for these projects in Supreme Court. Um, and then with Bethlehem, you had that subject to a permissive referendum. I think the, the messaging um, should be better related to these projects. And one of the suggestions I have for DOT is, does the current mission statement reflect the current goals and policies of DOT. For instance, is the mission of a traffic safety engineer at DOT focused on the safe and efficient movement of traffic, most likely focused on vehicular traffic, but does that same traffic safety engineer have a similar and equally important mission of the safe and efficient movement of people? I think this is an area that can be approved upon. When you look on DOT's website, um, where is the Office of Complete Streets or Division Overseeing Complete Streets. It, it seems to be vague in this area. There's 11 regions, and on the little information I was able to find, there's bicycle and pedestrian coordinators for each of the 11 regions. Who's overseeing these bicycle and pedestrian coordinators to ensure that they're advocating for complete streets in each of the 11 regions? I think this is an area that can be uh, improved upon. As you heard from the first two um, speakers, it seems to be an underlying theme of um, funding for complete streets. So I'll, I'll end with this. I believe there are long-term transportation planning impacts based on current funding and current initiatives at the state level. And they are directly related to the state's annual collection of petroleum business tax and motor fuel excise tax. For the two fiscal years ended March 31st, 2021 and 2020, the PBT alone totaled 942 million and 1.2 billion. The PBT directly funds the, de the dedicated highway and bridge trust fund. That fund was set up as capital highway improvement planning for the DOT. With the information that I provided in here, there seems to be a decades-long issue with how that funding is allocated. Issue so much that even the state's comptroller has commented on this. Currently about 75% of that fund, so out of $1 billion a year, 75% goes to debt service in DOT operations. Roughly 25% goes directly to capital projects. I think that's, if you can fix this fund somehow, that can speak to a lot of the issues you've heard from the previous speakers. Secondly, with the announcement last week of Governor Hochul's intent to direct the DEC by 2035 to have electric vehicles, um, both for passenger and SUV, I think that makes trying to fix this fund more difficult. You are now promoting electric vehicles in the state, which is a laudable effort. 
the main source of funding for the dedicated highway and bridge trust fund comes from gas taxes. I would hope the DOT, DEC, NYSERDA, and the assembly are all speaking about the fiscal impacts over the next 10 to 15 years. If we're gonna be promoting electrical vehicles in this state, but you are now reducing the funding for this fund, I think that makes it very difficult going forward. And not only for capital improvement projects, but then how do you pay for the debt service with DOT? So I would say the three main things that I think could help implementing complete streets in the state is we need more public advocacy from DOT, not just in providing assistance through grant funding, but I think if they're out at these local meetings with complete streets projects, what is the directive for the people at DOT at these meetings to be speaking on behalf of the local communities and for implementation of complete streets? Um, I think in terms of strictly financial, as I stated, I think there has to be some long-term financial analysis done in terms of how the dedicated highway and bridge trust fund will be funded as you move forward over the next five to 10 to 15 years based on our transition to electric vehicles and a severe reduction in the gas taxes that is funding this billion dollars a year. Uh, that'll be roughly $750 million a year um, just for debt service and state operations. Um, so that's, that's kind of, I think, some of the high points I wanted uh, to discuss today was for this committee to understand that we've heard, and I think everybody here can agree, that the complete streets policy is a laudable effort. Planners at the local level are trying to implement this policy throughout the state, but it's important for all of you to understand the local opposition we're getting, both associated with redevelopment and new development and associated with trying to implement grant-funded projects. I think it's important for you to understand that. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, I, I think we do understand it because we're kind of in the middle of it all the time. Um, as far as DOT advocacy is concerned, I, just, I, I guess my question would be, as you, you were working for new developments that were going to bring in more people, vehicles, pedestrians, everything. Okay, so it doesn't surprise me that there would be some people that would be for it and some people who would be against it. It seems like everybody has a better idea all the time. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know, you know, I don't know. I think it all depends on the specific development and how much DOT can get involved and can't get involved. But I don't want to speak to the DOT. As far as the funding is concerned, I think we're all thinking about how this is going to be funded. And we do want to see electric vehicles or at least non-fossil non fueled vehicles on the road as soon as possible. So um, yeah. We're going to have to deal with that. I, I, it's a pretty obvious thing that we are going to have to deal with. Um, anybody have any questions here? Yes, Ms. Fahey. First, uh, I want to start by saying um, thank you uh, to Mr. Kowalczyk. Um, your, your testimony, first of all, incredibly thorough, and I thought it was important um, that we have you here today. Uh, one, because when we talk about complete streets, we are often talking about urban areas, and a lot has been done in our urban areas. I live in the city of Albany, uh, but I represent Gilderland, uh, which is a, a suburban town, uh, and uh, represent Bethlehem as well. And I did see um, a complete street design uh, went down in a very bitter way for an existing highway, uh, Delaware uh, Avenue. So you, you really have pointed out uh, a number of problems with that, especially in the way um, it was interpreted and, and um, as you said, uh, sold, um, particularly if it might have meant a difference of one to two percent in terms of where traffic would be rerouted. rerouted. So 
um, and I'm, I bike on that road, and it's, um, it continues to be incredibly unsafe. Uh, it's a four-lane road, and uh, um, with very little changes could have, been, could have made it very safe. So I just think it's important to get that, your voice in today about that these complete street efforts run into many, many barriers, not just in our urban and uh, rural towns, uh, urban cities and, and rural towns, but also in our, our suburban areas. And um, my, my question would be on the, um, the mission statement. Well, first of all, the, a quick question on Ellesmere, where you used to work in Bethlehem. Uh, you mentioned that the few years in the 2013 to 2015, or 2011 to 2015, they had 213 crashes right on that uh, intersection, right by that grade school, by the way. Since then, since some of those changes um, were made, and I know there were some traffic calming measures, has that number gone down dramatically? Was that a six, one success, even though I know the overall Delaware Avenue project has been voted down? So when I was there, we were working with DOT. Um, they relocated the crosswalk. So the crosswalk used to be right across from where Els Mary. So it wasn't at, um, it wasn't at a signalized intersection. So the fix to that, without implementing the project, was they relocated the crosswalk to a signalized intersection, which dramatically helped, I think, with, with that. OK, because I, I, I thought those, those, OK, so just by even changing where a crosswalk is, even if we're not doing some other traffic calming measures there. And then on the, um, uh, on the complete streets, at the, the overall mission statement, uh, you mentioned that you could use more uh, of a DOT directive. And you're, you made similar comments to what our previous speaker had uh, referenced as well. What else do we need to be doing in addition to the mission statement at DOT to see this prioritized more? I think there's some inconsistencies with DOT when it comes to particularly grant-funded projects. Um, one example would be just to the north of Gilderland is the town of Rotterdam. So Route 146, which is a state roadway, uh, also known as Carmen Road in Gilderland, um, major north-south collector road. Um, years ago, Gilderland did um, a roundabout project um, and then also included sidewalks with that roundabout project. So currently in Bethlehem, we, DOT is now doing a roundabout project, but there were no sidewalk improvements included. So the town of Bethlehem, or town of Gilderland, um, is having to fund sidewalks um, with that roundabout project to connect down to Pinebush Elementary School. So I think there's inconsistencies when, if you're going to implement a traffic mitigation technique such as roundabouts, and include sidewalks on one project, shouldn't that be at least assessed as part of another project? Um, I think another is inconsistencies with grant-funded projects. I think it's important for this committee to know you've heard about the difficulties with inflation. Um, from the project award date to the project let date could be one to two to four years. A perfect perfect example of that is, I believe, Assemblywoman Fahey, who attended a ribbon cutting for a sidewalk project um, on Western Avenue yes. a few weeks ago. Um, so that project was about six-tenths of a mile, uh, made a connection to Gilderland Elementary School down to a commercial shopping center and then multiple apartment communities. So it linked maybe 400 apartment complexes now to the Gilderland Elementary School and our public library. The, project award date was March of 2018. The let date was April of 2022. So when that project was awarded, it was $635,000. When, when it came time to the let date, that was now $923,000. Luckily, that was a small enough project where we were able to work with the grant sponsor to come up with the additional funding, but put that towards a $5.2 million project such as in Bethlehem, and if you had the same issues, something has to be done to streamline that process, particularly now, as you heard with the first speakers related to the addition in building materials costs. That is up and down through the development community, and it reflects what we here at the local level are trying to implement. Um, we had another sidewalk project being built at the same time. Again, it had a, a project award date of March of 2018, where there, project estimate of $227,000. Mm -hmm. 
It was let on March of 2022, and that increased to 326,000. Again, that was another project making a connection to the Linwood Elementary School. So these are important projects that are, as you can see here, we have a lot of connections to schools, I think. So that's an example of some inconsistencies that I think need to be addressed in terms of if you're doing one project, why aren't the same safety enhancements being included in another project? Another example is Chairman Magnarelli, I believe, stated in his introduction was the exemptions. So when it comes to pavement alterations, currently DOT, if they're doing a mill and fill, they'll come and they'll address the curb ramps at intersections. But if you have non-compliant ADA sidewalks, they won't touch that, even on state roadways. That has to be addressed because the guidance that the town is getting from DOT is if you want the sidewalk fixed, apply for a grant application. I just showed you the issues we're having with the grant applications is it's very competitive. The environment we're dealing in now between, you know, these projects took four years from award date to let date with 50% increases in cost. So I think those are three really good examples of yeah. improvements that can be made. Thank, thank you, and I, I should add, uh, when I was at that ribbon cutting, the principal of the Gilderland Elementary School also made the point of those, those over 400 apartment buildings that, uh, and that's a major highway on Western Avenue, Route 20, uh, they had no other way of getting there uh, because it's not a bus route, and um, uh, so that also added to the social equity. So it took years, years and years of effort to just get those sidewalks in and uh, talk about putting pedestrian safety first. So kudos to the, huge kudos to the town of Gilderland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Rivera. Hi, thanks for coming in. Um, just a couple questions to clarify the examples that you gave. So in, in both of those examples, neither of them began with a road reconstruction or road resurfacing. Both of them were other projects that happened to also have road work, I guess, as part of them. For the sidewalk projects? No, you mentioned the ones, the one on uh, in front of the Crossgate Mall oh, and the other. Grant that's Park, associated with development. Right, right. So both those projects are essentially yeah. associated with it. And just to be clear, the the bill that we're talking about, or one of the bills we're talking about, it is strictly for uh, municipalities that are, that are determining that roads need to be done and, and whether they com whether that road work is going to have the considerations of complete streets or not. Not necessarily touching into development, necessarily. I just want to be clear that that's what this is that we're talking about. In terms of their... You're, us, you're, you're using examples where... You uh, mentioned the Crossgate Mall one, for example. That's a huge undertaking because you're, you're going to increase traffic by a lot if you're putting in a new Costco, a, a many-unit apartment complex, a big office building. So what I'm just stating, to be clear, is that this wasn't the town or the county deciding we're going to redo a road. This was the town or county deciding we're going to approve a, potentially approve a development project where in which... Correct. So addressing the roads might be part yeah, of it. It's, it's important to put that in a context because sure. Western Avenue, right in front of this corridor, roughly gets about 45,000 vehicles a day driving by there. One of the goals of our comprehensive plan, and then we did a neighborhood study specifically for this part of town, mm -hmm. was encouraging traffic to get off of Western Avenue to use Rap Road and Crossgates Mall Road as an alternative to get directly on to the Northway. So that was some of the underlying, sure. I guess, reasoning for the town was, yes, you have development coming in. We're trying to make this more of a community feel. So we're trying to take it from a yeah. four-lane road to a two-lane sure. road yeah. and it, improving all of their, the pedestrian accommodations associated with that because you do have high-density residential coming in with that, primarily because um, one thing I, I did not mention is kind of the, the centerpiece of these projects with Crossgate Mall is, Crossgate Mall will be the western terminus of CDTA's Purple Line. So they receive $61 million in federal funding for implementation of this bus rapid transit system. So the existing bus service from downtown Albany to Crossgates is 45 minutes. With the implementation of the BRT, that'll be reduced to 30 minutes. And it'll have direct connections um, separated bus lanes going through the nanotechnology campus, UAlbany, Harriman campus, St. Rose. So that's 
that was one piece in why the town specifically did a neighborhood study um, promoting getting off of Western Avenue, going down Crossgates Mall Road, is we're trying to minimize traffic on Western to utilizing this BRT line, utilizing their, their pedestrian infrastructure. And, and as the planner for the town, you felt good that, that taking advantage of the moment that if we're gonna sort of allow the, for this development that it was time to, to address the road work and also include in that traffic calming measures. The, primary recommendation from the Westmere Corridor study, which is the neighborhood mm -hmm. study that was done, was the creation of a transit-oriented development district encompassing the properties across Crossgates Mall and the property surrounding it. A TOD is promoting high-density development, typically within a half mile of whether it's a light rail station, bus station. Um, so, Yes, we were aware of all the work that was being done with CDTA and the BRT line. So from the town's perspective, um, they adopted that TOD zoning, mm -hmm. anticipating this development based on the recommendation of a year long planning process for that neighborhood. I always say planners have their work cut out for them. So I, I appreciate the work you do for your town. The other thing I'd say, and it's a half of a joke is that you mentioned earlier how you had so many people that were against the roundabouts. I've never met a, I, I've never met a roundabout that people didn't like at first, but then really were happy with five years later. Right. Not I think, five years, you know, ten years later in some cases. But, but uh, I think what the yeah. the public needs to know is, you may still have accidents at roundabouts, sure, but yeah. they're happening at much lower speeds, so the the accident rate is lower the damage done to vehicles is lower because you're traveling through that intersection at lower rates of speed. It's yeah, all I, I've seen entire villages really be transformed but through just sort of these sort of measures, roundabouts being one of them, but uh, you know, taking into account the way that we can move traffic and slow it down. And that's where you see commerce come, that's where you see businesses flourish, that's where you see you know, people being feeling safe enough to walk their kids outside. So. Well, I think stuff. that's one of the things that we need to look at kind of at the regional and state level is, so using the Delaware Avenue Complete Streets Project as an example, the town was trying to find research on what are the economic benefits of complete streets. It was hard to find it. There's a lot of information out there related to the traffic and safety improvements of complete streets, but it was <coughs> how do you sell a community when you have business owners asking what are the economic development development benefits of implementing this project and you can't really respond to that. So I, I think that's an area that DOT, the regional planning agencies such as CDTC, I would, even local municipalities would want to get involved with de doing that research because I think with just some of these projects we can now start giving you that research based on what we're seeing at the local level. Sure, for sure. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Simon. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions about some comments that you made about um, uh, litigation, Article 78, that was filed. I don't know whether it was both the Costco coming in or the apartments, th that whole project. Um, how um, did you determine that the, because I haven't read a complaint or anything, so I don't know what the uh, grounds were, um, that this was part and parcel of people opposing complete streets when they may have been just opposed to a Costco coming in. I mean, I go to Costco, but I know yep. nobody who lives near a Costco really likes Costco uh, being there because they attract uh, traffic. So um, uh, I'm just curious how you determined that this was related to complete streets or traffic calming, for example, versus just not yep. wanting that uh, level of um, congestion. So there were two Article 78s. The first mm -hmm. was primarily related to the environmental impact statement. Um, that's a 58-page document. There are probably at least 20, 25 pages of that document that speak directly to the town's intent on implementing complete streets as part of these projects and the traffic mitigation that we were proposing as part of these projects. So if somebody is going to sue the town over our adoption of that document, that tells me that they were opposed to our initiatives of trying to implement these initiatives. 
So having been a veteran of a number of these things, and I've never seen an EIS that was anything less than 1,000 pages, so I'm like really jealous of the, of the brevity no, of that our, document. But our record was 9,000 oh, okay. pages. The actual <laughs> finding statement was, um, was 58 pages. <laughs> uh, uh, but perhaps, you know, it, it may have been a dispute about the mitigations that were proposed themselves, for example, as opposed to the fact that there were mitigations. I'm just curious, uh, only because I think that sometimes people have different reasons for, for um, opposing something or opposing some aspect of something. That is, doesn't mean that they wouldn't uh, appreciate a lot of the mitigations um, uh, that come along with that project, for example. Well, that's, that's an interesting question because the, the developer that's doing the apartment project came back in July and August of this year to do an amendment to the site plan. Mm -hmm. And we had comments being made to our planning board on why are you putting these trails and sidewalks in because people aren't going to walk to the bus stop. Mm -hmm. I disagree with that. Mm -hmm. I do that <laughs> tells me that they are opposed to putting these pedestrian accommodations in. In relation to the traffic mitigation, I think we proposed... Um, nine different alternatives for trying to mitigate the traffic going into the city of Albany and the Rap Road Historic District. Mm -hmm. It was very difficult because the northern boundary of that apartment project site, uh, which is Gip Road, is the municipal boundary between the town and the city. So you had differing opinions between the city and the town on mitigation. There were probably four or five different neighborhoods along that corridor that somebody would like alternative three or that another community wouldn't. Um, the Pine Bush Preserve Commission, um, where this road kind of bisects uh, the southern or eastern portion of that was very involved with this. We were trying to work to implement um, what the Pine Bush thought would be a great traffic mitigation option. Um, but a lot of that was dead ending wrap road which would have really addressed the, the traffic mitigation. But you had neighborhoods, again, that could not come to a consensus. So with what you saw on site one was really uh, what we implemented on the town side for trying to mitigate that. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. We appreciate your testimony. Um, our next uh, person to come before the hearing is Ken Gray, Chair of the Complete Streets Advisory Board, Saratoga Springs. Mr. Gray, it's all yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Ken Gray. Yep. Um, I'm a member of Complete Streets uh, since late 2011, and I've served as chair for the past four years. Uh, just my background, I run a profit center for an insurance and risk management brokerage operation. My other passion besides Complete Streets is raising money for brain tumor research, raised over $2.8 million in research grants uh, under teambilly.org if you're interested. I'm also an avid cyclist on a business trip recently. I really enjoyed uh, uh, north of Watertown, a uh, uh, bike ride through the, uh, uh, from Clayton down to Vin uh, Port Vincent and uh, Cape Vincent. That's Cape Vincent. As good as it gets. Okay, it's it's beautiful. It's beautiful. So, uh, um, <laughs> and I'm a taxpayer. You invited me to address the existing law, which I know you read. Um, but the question is: Is the existing law doing what's intended? Where are we today? How can we improve? So, Highway Law 331, Complete Streets, enacted in 2011. The goal is to require New York State transportation plans to, I underline, consider providing greener, cleaner, and safer transportation systems, and it's for all roadway users. So the current situation, I'm speaking from a small city perspective, Complete Streets in Saratoga Springs has accomplished several significant projects through state and federal support, which we're very thankful, but we have much work to do. Recent actions by the legislature, for example, granting local authority uh, with the governor's uh, signing to enact 25 mile per hour speed limits in addition to funding opportunities are moving us in the right direction. I'm gonna reference uh, Field of Dreams quote, build it and they will come. So the Spring Run, uh, run Trail, which was funded by an, a half million uh, New York State Parks grant, I had friends laugh at me because it goes into a dead end. Right now it has 60,000 users. 
Railroad Run Trail connects residents to the YMCA, to the State Park, to the uh, Performing Arts Center, over 125,000 users. The Zim Smith Trail, which is partially over a sewer line, Mechanicville, and it connects with the Empire State Trail, 11.5 miles into Boston Spa with eventual plans to the State Park. Round Lake itself experiences over 100,000 annual users and boosts uh, the local economy. One of the bakeries is absolutely packed all the time with cyclists and walkers. We anticipate nine million funding requirements for project completion. It's gonna become the spine of the county bikeway network. Other large projects that we can state, uh, thank the state for, the downtown connector currently being about halfway finished between High Rock Park, the Farmer's Market, out to exit 15 on the Northway, a $3 million project. Geyser Crest, uh, passing by the elementary school to the state park, a $2.5 million project. Missing Links project underway for $1.7 million. And next year promised by the DOT, a bike path uh, for sidewalks and bike lanes on Union Avenue across from the, uh, the racetrack, a projected uh, cost of uh, $250,000, uh, and thank you, uh, Assemblywoman Warner, for pushing that. The challenge has been many of the projects do not connect, so many residents question the greater public benefit. During a recent de uh, street design bid for Union Avenue, we were thrilled to learn of a $3 million New York State Touring Routes grant. But having said that, we didn't know about it. A process needs to be in place so that we know of these opportunities at the outset. This funding will enable us to enhance and reimagine Union Avenue into the city from exit 14. Um, it's a primary roadway. And it's also gonna help us fund an engineering study to connect the east and west sides of Saratoga Springs. I don't have to mention aggressive driving behaviors necessitate implementation of complete streets designs. In Complete Streets education, while important, our resources are maxed, they're stretched, you name it, we've heard it this morning. Recently, we created a Complete Streets project inventory to share with political leaders and the public, and it's gonna assist, we believe, in priority planning. It took several months to compile. Recognizing limited resources, the Complete Streets process involves identifying, locating, justifying, and then awarding worthy projects. So the challenge is since 2011. Typical upstate communities, 20 to 40% of people cannot drive due to economic constraints, their age, or disabilities. Navigating grant requirements. City of Saratoga Springs is lucky. We have one person, but she's wearing many hats. Most communities don't have that person. Through experience, we find that the most highly successful commuter trail projects to get people from here and there involve utilizing existing surface areas along water, sewer, and power authority lines. Communication. We recently learned Saratoga County did not ask for surface rights along the Champlain Hudson Power Express project, which could create commuter trails from north to south through Saratoga County. We're hoping the window is still open for us, but we need someone at New York State to talk to when we don't know who. Railroad tracks can divide communities. The Greenbelt Trail designed uh, 10 years ago with much of the help of Jeff Olson, who you heard from uh, previously, crosses tracks to the proposed Allen Street low-income housing development, and it's halting a bike and pedestrian passage for those individuals to downtown. We need to solve that problem. Delayed and tabled projects due to unclear roadway requirements, and as you've heard earlier, interpretation of complete street law. Lake Avenue, a simple project of approximately 75,000, experienced two, two years of delays, and it granted a marginal implementation at the end. The proposed revision of, uh, for Saratoga Springs in uh, 2016 for the Complete Streets Plan originally incorporated language that all projects shall consider Complete Streets design in all roadway plans. I copied it from the Buffalo Complete Streets language. No, no reason to reinvent the wheel. Uh, local political leaders allege the word shall would create an unmanageable budget situation. The language was eventually changed to should. Cost objections causing unbudgeted cost concerns. Paint machines, engineering, uh, needing stamping authority, maintenance equipment, staffing, all legitimate, but sometimes common sense should prevail. I submit Complete Streets is still 
and I hate to say it, considered optional on both the state and local level. This needs to change. For example, bridge repair, repairs over the Northway between exit 13 and 15, and also over Saratoga Lake. Uh, great improvements, but DOT did not communicate with the Fleet Streets Advisory Board, and there was no opportunity for public comment. So the questions before in terms of how do we, how do we save money, how do we make, uh, how do we make this affordable, affordable, if we talked up front, I think a lot of those uh, cost savings could be answered. Additional hurdles. Traffic study requirements, while prudent, often confirm what we already know. I suggest studies be appropriate to the complexity of the project. So solutions. New York State needs to transition, and we heard this before, from MUTCD standards, and a lot of it dates back to 1971, to be more flexible and nimble to NACTO standards to meet current and future demands. MUTCD prioritizes moving vehicles first. Simple as that. I, we propose creation of a central authority providing resources to local municipalities to achieve complete streets outcomes. In that, planning must uh, make all accountable for implementation and time frames involving all stakeholders. New York State projects, they must accommodate complete streets considerations up front and collaborate with local authorities. We suggest providing shared resources and establish a formalized communication with complete street specialists throughout New York, sharing the expertise and minimizing the cost of professional uh, planners, stamping engineers. Again, a lot of communities, including Saratoga Springs, does not have a stamping engineer. Recent 25 mile per hour legislation is welcome. Suggests that the next step for New York State planners is to assist, assist with implementation involving communities across New York State. A best practices template will certainly help and there's no need to reinvent the traffic sign. That's a joke. Educate uh, stakeholders regarding complete streets policy on an ongoing basis and similar to how land use boards are trained to complement the power of their position. For example, uh, right now state agencies are already assisting our person in grant writing. We need to communicate planning and goals statewide and locally and I believe it'll promote better public understanding and support, especially when you have one road or one trail or one bike lane going to nowhere. I think it's gonna shorten time frames and it's gonna be a better use of our tax dollars. Other considerations, uh, New York State involvement, whenever we're dealing with government authorities and routes cra uh, crossing railroad tracks, we hit a dead end. So that would be really helpful. Uh, another idea, New York State purchasing power. If we're gonna be implementing these um, uh, complete streets accommodations, uh, cost for maintenance equipment, for paint striping, or sharing it between uh, localities, snow removal, all those kind of good things. And if anyone can help us on the Champlain Hudson Power Express, uh, we welcome that assistance before it's too late. I submit we, revision, we revisit our vision and commitment to complete streets from the state level down to the local level. We look at the current legislation and language and how can we communicate our vision more effectively. We evaluate mutual resources and strengths to maximize outcomes. We embed complete streets, complete streets best practices into the daily routines at all levels, including DOT government authorities and the local planning boards. And then we budget for adequate municipal staff and maintenance. In doing so, I believe we'll produce optimal outcomes and we'll truly create complete and connected streets. And I can't be more thankful for you listening. Well, thank you very much, sir. And uh, um, like all the other people who have been speaking today, I, I agree with uh, the idea that we're all trying to get complete street streets moving in our state and in front of everybody as we plan out what we're going to do in the future. So I do appreciate your testimony. Are there any questions? the speaker and I know Mr. Walczyk is very happy to have heard some of the things you said so. you're welcome back to the front yard of America anytime <laughs> it's, it's, All right. beautiful. it's beautiful thank you very much sir thank you next we have Susan Parker Chautauqua County legislator
Okay. Thank you very much for hanging in with us here, and we look forward to your testimony. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chairman and the members of the New York State Assembly Committee on Transportation for this opportunity to testify today. I am a Chautauqua County legislator rep representing District 4 in the village of Fredonia and town of Pomfret. I am also speaking as a member of the New York State Safe Streets Coalition. Um, as probably most of you know, SUNY Fredonia is in the village of Fredonia, so we have 4,000 students in our village as well. Um, I'd like to thank the New York State DOT in the Western New York Region 5 directors, engineers, designers, and other personnel <laughs> in Chautauqua and Erie counties that I have spoken to. They have been and are accessible, knowledgeable, and they work to find to answer questions and find uh, feasible solutions, so I really appreciate them. I'm here today to encourage changes to our state law to apply complete streets policy and practices whenever the Department of Transportation undertakes planning for maintenance and resurfacing projects, as I believe this is being considered. This change is especially important for rural communities where state highways oftentimes are the main streets of our community. In the village of Fredonia, Route 20 actually divides half of Main Street, it is our Main Street, and it divides half of our village from the other half. It is the, it is the widest um, road in our village, and it is currently in a, um, not currently safe for bicycles and pedestrians, despite a number of um, efforts. I also wanted to speak uh, to say there are 53 rural counties in New York State um, in counties like Chautauqua, which has a population of 127,000 state roadways were designed. My understanding is Route 20 was designed in 1926 or something. Berkshire to Ripley going into Pennsylvania, 372 miles. And basically, I think it was designed just to go through as quick as you possibly can. And that uh, state road still remains the, the main way other than the throughway to get from point A to point B and goes right through the center of the village of Fredonia. The result is that in many towns and villages like Fredonia, we have a state road that bisects our business district, downtowns, and gathering places. People have been talking about the average daily traffic in the village of Fredonia, we have 13,000 we have 13,000 motor vehicles that um, go in either direction every day. Um, I know that the supervisor from Elmira said in the center of Elmira they have 20,000, so I think 13,000 is a pretty good indication that we're a pretty busy place. State highways have a significant impact on a rural community's ability to make streets safe and usable for everyone. State highways have a significant influence on where people go and how business is con conducted in communities. The main reason to allow complete streets to be included in maintenance and resurfacing projects is that once a complete streets road project is completed in a village like Fredonia, the work will not be revisited or reconsidered for a few years and in some cases likely decades. Resurfacing and maintenance, however, is performed more routinely and more regularly. So resurfacing and maintenance, uh, we do have a maintenance project that is scheduled for the village of Fredonia for, to start in 2024 and it is milling and repaving. Um, and a project like that allows for improvement to a complete streets project that was done quite a few years ago. The Department of Transportation performs great work, but there's no way to improve upon the changes in a rural village like Fredonia without consideration for complete streets when maintenance and resurfacing programs are undertaken. For example, a few, year, uh, a few years ago, I think they started it like seven years ago and completed it four years ago, the department's uh, last project was in 
a town just beyond the village of Fredonia. And they, um, as part, as a peripheral part to the Route 20 complete streets, they introduced bike lanes, made additions of about eight crosswalks, and we now have 16 crosswalks between like an, a one and a half mile area. But they are not um, complete. You still can't. Uh, we did a, an informal survey of our residents, and going right into the village of Fredonia, it was a really nice crosswalk, uh, you know, and it has the signs with the big green signs saying stop, and people can't cross the road, you know, because it's about 60 feet wide, and it's just not made, despite the crosswalks, to be um, traversed by um, pedestrians. And some of the bike lanes kind of almost like disappear, sort of they don't follow a logical, or I mean, I'm sure they did, but they don't seem to be completely safe for bikes. Uh, final, um, when a village, a village can do improvements on local routes, roads, it can only enforce the law respecting a state route through its community and cannot do anything to make it safer for pedestrians, bikes, children and families and persons with special needs. Um, Allowing for maintenance and resurfacing projects to, uh, to include complete streets applications provides a means to improve and correct issues that arise or remain from a larger project as completed. Um, it is my belief that it would be a, an essential and useful step in the complete streets project and a natural step as well in that you come through, make complete streets changes, and um, and then with the maintenance and resurfing projects, projects as, as several people have mentioned, you can come in and do some, it doesn't even have to be re-engineering, it can be certain improvements that actually make these, make these streets more pedestrian and bike friendly. Thank you again for this opportunity. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm a little bit confused here, and I was just checking with my, with staff, but so what you're saying is the state did come in, the DOT, and they did do something on uh, Route 20 through Fredonia, and they did make some complete street, in quotes, improvements. But what I'm get gathering from you is that you don't think they went far enough or there are other things that could be done uh, to make that street safer for the people who live in the village. But it would seem, I, I guess, what I'm going on is 331 that says you have to consider complete streets uh, affects any projects that are undertaken by the DOT. So it has to. So now my next question would be, are there other projects on Route 20 that the DOT is going to take up that maybe additional complete street um, uh, modifications could be made as well. Um, what the the project was in was actually in the town of Pomfret beyond the village of Fredonia, oh. and it was a big roundabout project, which, okay. you know, really it was the busiest intersection in Chautauqua County that they changed, and it had multiple accidents, just like the other, mm -hmm. uh, you know, other people have mentioned. And so what they did was they did the roundabout, which is in the town of Pomfret, not the village of Fredonia. And as part of that project, they came through and added just beyond um, the, the border into the village of Fredonia. They, create, they put up a, a crosswalk was already there where the school is, but they put in a lighted crosswalk there. It's just when you come off the roundabout. roundabout. And then they extended and did some more, put some more crosswalks in um, as part of the, I don't know, I'm, I, you know, I mean, I, the paid, the design book is like, you know, very long. Right. Um, and they came in and put some crosswalks in as well and some yeah. other um, minor things. So I would not say that the village of Fredonia was actually part of that project. No. The other thing is that the village of Fredonia has gotten some ADA compliant um, changes to their traffic lights as part of a county like Erie County, Cattaraugus County, Chautauqua County project. We've gotten some 
you know, target focused improvements. And so what I'm saying is there's a maintenance project coming in that is going to uh, start in 2024. And I, um, I think it's a natural improvement on the changes that have been made sort of almost like piecemeal a little bit. Right. Because it hasn't been like a big project right. like you envision. Um, but this maintenance project has to do with Route 20 going through the village. Yeah, it starts at the boundary, yeah. goes to the west, so remill. They, maintenance, uh, doesn't maintenance doesn't even in the state? No. Okay, I get it. That's where I'm confused. We have to get, <laughs> we a have lot. to, okay, a maintenance project doesn't fall in there if it was a... Right, and we okay. actually, we did a, our own, like we did a work, I was part of a work group that did a study on areas of concern and we have contacted the DOT and and they are going to come and have a, like at least one public meeting about some changes. But again, you know, there's, because it's a maintenance project, hmm. it's, you know, those changes will be... Okay. Have to talk to the DOT, I guess. Mr. Rivera, is this anywhere near your district? <laughs> not my county. <laughs> no, 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 I know that, but no, is it close? No. It's I think far. I said we're like Somebody far. needs a little help here. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like two and a half hours to Pittsburgh, two and a half yeah. hours to Cleveland. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's in Assemblyman Goodell's district. Sorry? It's, it's in Goodell's district. I got yeah. it. Um, Don't hold that against me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, we like Andy. <laughs> Andy's, Andy's all right. Like, I don't know. We like uh, Andy. So just to sort of get a, if I could summarize the, the concern, and I'm pretty sure it's consistent, and I know I've seen it in my county, is if the state is going to come in and do a maintenance project on a road, uh, because it's not a total reconstruction, they don't have to take into account all of the complete streets considerations. Exactly. So you're, what you're saying as someone who is in county government that represents multiple municipalities that has state roads going, going through your district, you know that the state's not gonna do another reconstruction probably for a long, long time. So while they're here doing a maintenance project, the ideal thing would be while you're already there is to take into complete street consideration. Exactly. Because the next time they'll they'll redo Route 20 as a total reconstruction, considering that they've already done one maintenance thing and maybe they've done another one before that, you know, which is all necessary because the road is only going to last as long as it lasts. Because they're not doing a reconstruction, ideally you would want them to take into account complete street consideration. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Is, are you. there any other questions? Okay. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Okay. Next, we have a panel. Uh, Amy Cohen, co founder of Families for Safe Streets, along with Diana Alati, member of Families for Safe Streets. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Good morning. Thank good, you. Good to see you again. Good to see you too. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Amy Cohen, and I'm the co-founder of Families for Safe Streets. On behalf of Families for Safe Streets and the entire New York Streets, Safe Streets Coalition, we are grateful to be able to support, speak in support of the three complete streets bills in the Crash Victim Rights and Safety Act and urge that they be passed and signed into law with the urgency that the crisis on our road, roadways across the state requires. I know firsthand the pain of traffic violence and how it can bisect lives and fracture families. This Saturday, it will be nine incredibly long and painful years since I kissed my 12-year-old son, Sammy, goodbye for the last time in the fall of his eighth grade years. Nine years since I touched his face, smelled his unique Sammy smell, saw him chatting with his sister, made him breakfast, and gave him a hug goodbye. No. That fateful day marks the time before. Instead, for the past nine years, at every holiday meal and milestone, the cliche of the empty chair manifests our family's reality. Every parent thinks their child is special, but Sammy really was amazing. 
He was curious about the world. He loved to ask questions. He carefully pondered the answers and then always seemed to have an unquenchable desire to know more. He was a budding Renaissance man. He excelled in sports with fierce determination. He played soccer, baseball, and hockey. And just weeks before he died, he rode his bike with my husband, Gary, in the New York City Century Ride. And at 12 years of age, was the youngest one to complete all 100 miles. I thought my love was so strong that I could create an invisible shield around my children. Sammy was smart, street savvy, and did not take risks. We lived in a safe residential neighborhood where children played on the side streets, though I never allowed mine to do so. But every year, thousands of parents, like me, learn that their shield is fallible that we cannot protect the ones we love from senseless deaths and life-altering injuries. No one should have to pay for it with their life just to get to their destination. So after Sammy's death, I was so full of pain and it had to go somewhere or it would consume me. So I started speaking out. Soon, I joined with others and helped form Families for Safe Streets. Our mission is to confront the preventable epidemic of traffic violence and support those personally Im impacted. All of our members, like me, have lost a family member, suffered a life-altering injury in a traffic crash. We are parents, children, partners, and siblings and represent the full breadth of New York's diversity. We give a face to the numbers in this preventable public health crisis. I'm here today with other FSS members who are not able to speak because of the limits on number of speakers, so I am going to share their stories with you because each number is more than a statistic. Debbie Kahn is here representing her son and only child, Seth, who was killed on a very dangerous street that was only made into a complete street after he was killed. Seth brought color, humor, and positive energy into the world wherever he went. He was studying toy design at FIT and working for a company creating movable holiday windows and animated displays for major department stores, Lincoln Center, and various facilities all over the world. He had such a promising future, but it was all cut short instantly. Thank you, Debbie. Also with me is Rose Quinn, whose husband John was killed while going on a bike ride, something he loved to do on a street that lacked the appropriate infrastructure to protect him. It was particularly horrific for Rose because she was, by profession, a street safety educator working on a Governor's Highway Traffic Safety Grant. All his friends called John Host, a nickname he acquired at college for being the first to make a newcomer feel welcome and appreciated. Irma lost her very active 88-year-old mother, Ida, who was on her way from her meditation class when she was struck by a speeding driver making a left turn on a wide and dangerous roadway. She was so severely injured that she lost consciousness, and after two long, terrible days, she died in the hospital. Still, she, before she died, she was an activist, often meeting with elected officials to urge better services for seniors and have her voice heard. Irma, reluctantly, has become an activist to honor her mother and prevent this heartache. Gabriella O'Shea suffered a horrific injury on September 11, 2016, from which she is still recovering. She was just trying to ride her bike from the village of New Paltz, where she lives, to her friend's house. She was struck on the road that connects the village to the widely used local recreation area. But, like many, it is a road that lacks the necessary infrastructure for all who are using the road today. According to the pavement data reports conducted annually, the shoulder of Route 20, 299, where she was hit, uh, along that stretch are, is four to six feet, feet wide when the road was be, built in 1949, and it was down to one foot wide by 2016. 
There was an initial project proposal submitted to the County Highway Department 10 days before Gabby was hit, indi indicating shoulders absent at that location. Gadg Gabby's injuries were extensive and severe, affecting her head, neck, ankles, elbows, ribs, pelvis, and vertebrae. She's had nine surgeries and has made tremendous gains, but the crash left her legally blind. She still suffers from a severe traumatic brain injury and has not, and still has not, recovered most of her pre-crash memories. Her friends created a website where they post pictures of things they've done with her, but most seem like they were events that happened to someone else. That is not what it should mean to be a lucky one to survive. Horrifically, Gabby is one of over 130,000 people who've suffered life-altering injuries in New York State since the Complete Streets Act passed in 2011. Please don't tell me that what we have is enough. Patty Sawyer's son, Roger. Patty just had to leave for work, um, so she is not here. But Roger was just trying to get to work very early in the morning on October 19, 2017, when he was hit and killed by a speeding driver very close by on Washington Avenue Extension. It is a dangerous, wide road that encourages drivers to speed, including the driver who killed Roger. He was outgoing, full of life, and made everyone laugh. He was good with his hands and a quick learner. He had a job that he loved repairing appliances, and he enjoyed being able to ride his bike every morning to get to work in Schenectady. Roger was only 30 years old. He'd been the best man at his brother's wedding two years before, but never got to get married or start his own family. I have photos of all these people at the end, including of Roger, dressed as the best man for his brother's wedding. I'm also here with Diana Alati, whose 13-year-old son, Andrew, died on July 30th, 2019. Diana's testifying, so I'll let her share more about Andrew. But I encourage you strongly to read about Andrew and his family and the deadly nature of Hempstead Turnpike in this month's uh, Bicycling Magazine article. Lastly, Sandy Vega was hoping to join today, but could not make it at the last minute. I want to share her story because she fought for the initial Complete Streets bill after her 14-year-old daughter, Brittany, was killed. Brittany was her firstborn, and if she were still here, she would be 26 years old, but her life ended at 14, and she never even got to graduate high school, attend college, get married, or have children. Brittany befriended everyone and never left anyone out. She was just trying to walk to school in Wontaw, Long Island, but to get there, she had to cross six lanes of traffic on Sunway's Highway, one of the most deadly streets on Long Island. She had decided to walk that morning instead of taking the bus because she wanted to see some of her favorite teachers before school started. She never made it across. Sunrise Highway was deadly when New York State passed the Complete Streets Bill after her advocacy, and sadly, it's still one of the most deadly today. You cannot tell me that what we have is sufficient. So while I am grateful to be here, I am today I'm also angry and heartbroken. Since Sandy poured out her heart to pass the Complete Streets Bill in 2011, over 12,000 New Yorkers have been killed in traffic and 130,000 seriously injured. I want to repeat those numbers. 12,000 people, you heard this heartache. It does not end. This will be something I live with forever. And 100,000 injured like Gabby, who never will reach the potential she could have had that not happened. Last year, FSS joined forces with over 100 organizations and started the New York State Safe Streets Coalition a coalition that, in addition to Families for Safe Streets, is led by the Albany Bicycle Coalition, Bike Walk Tompkins, Go Bike Buffalo, the National Safety Council, the New York Bicycling Co Coalition, Open Plans, Parks and Trails, Reconnect Rochester, Rochester Bicycling, Slow Roll Syracuse, Transportation Alternatives, Tri-State Transportation, and Walkable Albany. 
Together, we are fighting to pass the Crash Victim <laughs> Rights and Safety Act, a package of life-saving bills that includes three bills on complete streets for funding, maintenance, and the application bill. Uh, another bill in the package is Sammy's Law, which is named after my son, so we will be back to prep for that as well. The three proposed complete streets bills incentivize the completion of complete streets and lift problematic restrictions. Um, I'll skip ahead a little just because I think we covered what a complete street is and what these measures do. But I just want to say that I am tired of the excuses no, the proposed changes will not require that rural roadways put sidewalks in areas with no pedestrians. No, the bill will not prevent communities from fixing a pothole because they need to do a costly assessment. No, the bills will not require that fewer street safety projects be completed. No, complete streets do not have to be so expensive. Much can be done just with with paint and, and maintenance. Yes, we need to incentivize and lift restrictions on where and when they can be implemented because if everything was invent be going so fine, we wouldn't have 12,000 dead people and 120,000 injured. When people talk about burdens earlier today, I am here to tell you that the burden of living in this pain and burying your child is unimaginable and unacceptable. And the costs, when we talk about complete street, also go to the cost the state pays every time someone is killed with hospital costs and other things and the cost of our heartache. And yes, these bills that we have proposed our best practice and follow the guidance of Transportation um, America and what's implemented in other states. And I realize it's not my testimony the link, so I will sit, share it later, but Smart Growth America has um, what are 10 points that uh, make up best complete streets policy. And number three is Projects should apply, well, complete streets should apply to all projects and phases. Instead of a limited set of projects, it applies to all new, retrofit, reconstruction, maintenance, and ongoing projects. This is best practice recommended by the number one national organization on complete streets and is being replicated in states across the country. Why is New York not leading the way? So we have, uh, so I am tired, frustrated, and angry, and these excuses, that these excuses are being used to prevent life-saving measures from being put in place. We have a crisis on our roadways and no community is exempt. Again, we urge the legislature to pass the Complete Streets Maintenance and Application Bills. Thank you for your sponsorship, Assembly Member. Faye and Dee Dee Barrett on our bills and, and Assemblymember Rivera. Every day we wait, several more New Yorkers join our horrible club and face a lifetime of heartache mourning their child, parent, sibling, or spouse who becomes the next statistic. Every day we wait, people face life-altering injuries that alter their future forever. The excuses have to stop. Now is the time to act. Thank you. And again, please look at these photos. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Ms. Alati, do you want to speak? It's yours. Thank you all for having me. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Diana Rilotti, and I am a member of Families for the Safe Streets. On June 30th, 2019, my life forever changed when my 13-year-old son, Andrew Rilotti, was run over by a reckless driver on a very dangerous road, one of the most dangerous roads in Long Island, according to a recent article about Hempstead Turnpike and my family. The link to the article also appears at the bottom of my testimony. Andrew loved to ride his bike and had just reached an age where he was pressing me to be able to go around on his bike with his friends. K 
kids should be allowed to be hanging out with their friends without it being a deadly act. My husband had called Andrew telling him it was time to come home for dinner. We never imagined that my husband's call to get your ass home for dinner would be the last time we spoke to him. Andrew's body was thrown eight feet into the air before crashing down on the vehicle that killed him. I thought, no, this couldn't be happening. Not my Andrew. The initial pain of losing your child is unimaginable, but I am here because I want each and every one of you to know that Andrew's life mattered. And my pain for him will never end. My family and I miss him dearly and suffer every day knowing that we will never see him graduate or have a family of his own. My heart is forever broken and will never heal. Andrew was an incredible young man. His smile lit up the room and his generous heart was even bigger. He had a funny sense of humor and was silly at times. Being in his presence made, me, made people feel that there was always someone on their side. Andrew was like a magnet. Everybody gravitated to him. He never let anyone feel alone, left out, or forgotten. He loved his family and gave the best bear hugs. Andrew's kindness and laughter brought people of all ages together. He was a natural leader who always stood up for what he felt was right. Andrew's true passion was baseball, but he always enjoyed hockey, playing his musical instruments, dancing, drawing, listening to music, and traveling. He lived life to the fullest, but he didn't deserve, he deserved many more years. Andrew would have been 16 years old today, so I can't think of no better way to mark his birthday than to demand action on his name. I am here today to honor my son and continue his legacy of compassion and helping others. Since his death, I have been fighting to fix deadly Hempstead Turnpike where Andrew was killed. Hempstead Turnpike is a perfect example of a road crying out for complete street fixes. It runs 16 miles long from the border of New York City into Long Island and divides many villages, hamlets, and towns like mine. In Bethpage, where I live, it is six lanes road with wide lanes and no safe, easy way to cross. Plus, there's a lot of stores, a library, and more making it chaotic and dangerous. So many children like Andrew have friends who live on the other side of Hempstead Turnpike. I was terrified to let, him, to let my son travel alone to his friend's house and for years drove him a short distance to their homes, just so he didn't have to cross it. The speed near me is 40 miles per hour, which already is too high. But I think the road is built such wide lanes and no engineering fixes to, to slow traffic down so that most drivers ignore the speed limit. The driver who killed Andrew admitted he was going over 50 miles per hour. This is a street calling out for traffic calming. Narrow lanes, rumble strips in, at the intersection. Medium bulb outs to make it easier for those crossing and send signals to drivers to slow down. Given the chaos of Hemtes Turnpike and how many people live, work, run errands, and play nearby, it is no surprise that the communities the Turnpike runs through constantly has the highest annual death rate for cyclists and pedestrians in the nation. According to the U.S. Department of Transportation, as noted in the article, in recent years, Hempstead Turnpike has been dubbed the most dangerous street in all of downstate New York and Connecticut and New Jersey by the Tri-State Transportation Campaign a regional advocacy group that studies traffic safety according to data from the Nassau County and Hempstead Village Police Department. Drivers on Hempstead Turnpike hit more than 320 cyclists and pedestrians in the past 10 years. 
and likely many more that are not reported. 13 people like my son have been killed during this period, many just in a few past years. As indicated in the article, I mentioned the NAS, uh, New York State Department of Transportation shared that in recent years, it implemented, implemented hundreds of safety enhancements along the turnpike. These changes have resulted in 30% decline in the number of people killed there. But clearly, the fact that the Hempstead Turnpike is still listed as one of the most dangerous places and the fact that no changes have been made to the turnpike anywhere near me and much more needs to be done and quickly before someone else like my son dies on this deadly road. But I am here today not just to demand changes where Andrew died. I am also fighting for the three life-saving complete street bills in the Crash Victim Right and Safety Act to prevent others from the heartache that I have endured. This is a huge crisis. Every day, three people like my son are killed in New York. Please, for Andrew, for your children, your family members, please pass the complete street maintenance and application bill with the urgency of this crisis requires. And, Gover and Governor Hochul, if you are and your staff are listening, please sign the complete street funding bill so that Beth Page and other towns get resources they need to end this crisis. Thank you. Well, thank you both very much for being here again uh, today. Um, I don't know what to say to you, except that we are uh, working on these matters and continue to work on them, trying to uh, find solutions that will work for everybody and save lives. Um, we did uh, pass that one bill last year, your bill, it's waiting, for, and others, and it's waiting for uh, Governor Hochul's signature, and I hope that happens uh, before the end of the year and better. And um, as you can see, we are taking very seriously uh, the other complete streets bills as well uh, to make sure that we do them in a way that people can depend on them, that people will understand that we're doing uh, all that we can to make our streets safe uh, and usable uh, by pedestrians, bicyclists, et cetera. So uh, for myself, um, I thank you for your advocacy and for being here again. I know this is not easy uh, for you. Um, and to be honest, it's hard to listen to, and I, I know that's why you do it, and it works. So um, I want to thank you again for being here, and uh, we are taking these things very seriously. Uh, and with that, I'm going to open it up to Ms. Faith. I, I don't have any questions right now. I just want to, to thank you for being here and thank you for your extraordinary advocacy, the fact that you are channeling your extraordinary tragedies uh, in each of your lives and um, channeling that into your advocacy is, is, um, it is remarkable. I think we have a tremendous, tremendous amount of work to do. You've sensed a frustration among many of us today with how hard this has been. Uh, some of the bike bills I've carried, I've had, I think, a half dozen years. So this is, none of this is easy, but um, I, I, I truly admire you, you especially for being here on what would be your son's 16th birthday. So please, please keep speaking up, each of you. It does matter, and I, I think more people we would see more lives lost if it weren't for, for your advocacy uh, in the city and, uh, and here. So, um, you know, as a mom, I want to say thank you so much for channeling this tragedy. And we will continue to look forward to working with each of you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. You. Chairman, for holding this hearing yeah. on such an important topic. Thank you, Assemblymember. I just want to say, you know, your number one job 
is to protect your constituents. And I know you have to balance many factors, but yes, we come here, despite the fact that it is hard to remind you that that is your number one responsibility. We, we take it seriously. Um, Ms. Simon. Thank you, um, Amy, thank you again for, as always, coming out and testifying and channeling your pain, and Ms. Alati as well. Um, you know, I, I you know, just want to uh, reiterate what um, Assemblymember Fahey said, um, but also we've heard some testimony today about how difficult it is to do these things, or how it seems to me um, uh, aligning uh, concerns about particular projects, for example, as somehow or other being a concern about complete streets. Um, I'm wondering whether in your work um, uh, you have ever heard anybody being opposed to the actual uh, requirements of complete streets and to doing of complete streets um, as opposed to uh, being uh, concerned about a particular remedy that's being offered or mitigation that's being offered is perhaps not being as effective um, as it should be. Uh, so a couple of thoughts on that, and, and thank you, Assembly Member. It was my honor to be uh, your constituent for many years until sadly they redistricted me to someone else. Uh, but in terms of you know opposition, we have done a study, and I don't have the number at my fingertips, so I'm going to let Danny answer that. I think he's testifying next. But um, we have done surveys and found that actually complete streets are overwhelmingly popular. So I will share. I uh, say I share your thoughts on the, that particular projects that people were talking about. I think it had a lot more to do with opposition to Costco and other development. Um, in addition, I think though that his testimony illustrated why bills like the complete streets and application bills are so important that we need that these items and life-saving measures be considered any time you are doing maintenance mm -hmm. or any time projects are from city or state funding, not both, because that is so infrequent. <coughs> Uh, because that is the role of government, to force uh, towns to look at these measures. And it is not saying, as I said before, that like every time they do a pothole, no, it's, you know, there is language about it has to be, you know, a, a large percentage of the project. Right, let me find the exact language. Sorry, that's Bri. I brought my laptop. Had to get up so early to get here. My brain isn't working. Um, I know like places like Buffalo, for example, have a 20% um, threshold that the project Many localities have um, complete streets bills have to have a specific 20% threshold before they can apply to projects. And the current complete streets law is context sex sensitive. So it states that you know, a complete street is not necessary if the cost of specific projects would be disproportionate to the needs as determined by factors, including but not limited to land use context. So yes, a rural road, you don't have to necessarily exactly. put in a bike lane current and projected traffic volumes, population density, et cetera. So, you know, a lot of the excuses we heard today, I I'm sorry, they're, they're, I'm tired of the excuses. People are dying. You don't have to do it, like I said, just for a pothole. Community opposition, we don't experience that. I would pet that example in the context of Costco. And it is the elected official's responsibility anyway to consider it even if there was community opposition, which we have not experienced. I mean, complete streets downstate as well as other state, upstate places that have put, put them in are incredibly popular. And a bike lane, it's really not even just for bicyclists. I know you asked a, a question about that. You know, we do hope, hope it is widely used, but the road diet is the most important part mm -hmm. of a bike lane. It's all about making those roadways a little bit narrower. You heard her describe Hempstead Turnpike. How would you like to send your child across that street? I don't know how many of you have been out there. I think of every lot wide arterial in your community that's bisecting suburban communities with friends on one side and friends on the other. Now you put in that little road diet, you put bulb outs in for intersections, you have a median in the middle and you make it possible that Everyone can share the roadway, and it makes it safer not just for those crossing, but even for the drivers and passengers. Many of our members and Families for Safe Streets and Complete Streets are all about protecting everyone. We have members who were driving who were killed, or passengers who were killed. This is not only just about protecting those most, most vulnerable, but when you do protect those most vulnerable, you make it safe for everybody. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much for your testimony. Next, we have Danny Harris, Executive Director of Transportation Alternatives. My understanding is you're going to email us your yes. testimony. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Danny Harris. I'm honored to be the Executive Director of Transportation Alternatives. Uh, for nearly 50 years, TA has been on the forefront of fighting for safe and accessible streets in New York City, and we are honored to partner with Families for Safe Streets in our work not only in New York City, but across the state and growing across the nation. I want to thank you, Chair Magnarelli, for convening this hearing today and to the members of the Council for your attendance and your leadership. Uh, as we've just heard, I've been in this role for uh, a number of years now, and uh, they are not simply just the, the stories that we hear. These are the lived experiences of our neighbors every single day. Uh, I'm so honored that we have fam members of Families for Safe Streets who have been here. I also want to um, call out Robin, who lost her husband, uh, whose name wasn't mentioned, but it's important that everybody who's here uh, also be recognized in that their stories and their experiences continue to move forward. What we're learning about in their stories is the impact of incomplete streets. Streets that destroy families, that destroy communities, that destroy our environment, that destroy economic opportunity. Let me just share, as you all know, transportation is the leading cause of greenhouse gas emissions in the state. Commute time is the single most important indicator of moving people out of generational poverty. Traffic crashes are the leading cause of death for our children, not only in the state, but across the nation. And the list can go on and on, and I'm happy to share the specifics. So when we start talking about what is possible here, I want us to also add in all of the externalities, especially the negative externalities of what we're doing with incomplete streets. Not only how it's killing our neighbors and our residents, but how it's killing our neighborhoods. Just simply look at what our downtowns look like 50 years ago, what they look like now. I also invite you to take a look at what EVs are looking like. We're grateful that there's a future that may not be on gas and electric, but a 9,000 pound Hummer EV that can go zero to 60 in 3.3 seconds is, is definitely not the future that we're looking forward to. And that's where we need real solutions on traffic violence. And this state is on the front line of that crisis. It's not just a national problem, it's a statewide problem. As you know, according to the State Department of Health, traffic crashes are the leading cause of injury-related death in our wonderful state. For the most vulnerable among us, those numbers are even higher. If you are young, if you are old, if you have limited abilities, if you're walking with a stroller, if you're low income, if you're a community of color, if you are under the age of 14 in the state of New York, the leading cause of your death will be traffic violence. I grew up in this incredible state, and before I was 16 years old, I had two classmates who had already died in car crashes. So it's the experience of the family, everybody around, the moment that the principal has to get on the school and make an announcement again that another classmate has died twice before 16. Every loss of life is a tragedy as we hear, and when we fail to do something, we make continued excuses about why the normal that we've existed with before remains normal, then let me just say quite simply it is a failure. Not only a failure of imagination, failure of leadership. Engineering safe streets is the most important element to reducing the number of people injured or killed on our streets, all of our streets, no matter where we live. It's the main opportunity to save lives. Yet we continue to lag behind. And we hear a number of reasons why, but I, I would just simply say that we are blessed in this state that we have the proven solutions for traffic violence. You can take a look across the communities from what we're able to do with daylighting to widening uh, sidewalks to putting in protected bike lanes and recognizing that not every neighborhood is the same, but every individual in the state deserves the same right, which is to cross the street, to get to school, to get to a place of worship, to go be with their older parents, to age in place without the fear of death or serious injury. Complete streets are a proven tool to do that. They support pedestrians, public transit riders, bicyclists, and drivers, and most importantly, they also give us options. Right now, if you are in a community and the only way you have to get around is with a vehicle, 
and to spend upwards of $10,000 a year in car-related pay payments, according to AAA. This, in the state of ours, where billions of New Yorkers are carrying crippling debt in car-related payments because we do not provide them options. Complete streets are an option. They help to complete not only the street, but also to give you financial stability. It's good if you're eight, it's good if you're 80, it does not matter. These are tools that support. And we know that it's not just that they help biking and walking, but that they decrease injuries and fatalities by upwards of 30%. They build li healthy, livable communities. And even as a road diet was discussed before, they can reduce um, cra crash frequencies by up to 25% by simply removing one lane of car traffic. It's good for jobs. One billion dollar invested in public transit supports, our, supports upwards of 50,000 new jobs. We know that people spend more money in local businesses when they're on bike lanes as opposed to when they're in a car. Again, all of these statistics just show we have all of the reasons of why we can't do it. There's no shortage of data that suggests that this is not just good for New York, but we've already done it and we need to scale it. Simply put, in doing this, we can rely, we can reduce the amount of, of reliance that everybody has on just simply getting out and getting in a car. This doesn't take away your car. Let me be perfectly clear. This gives people options. As we recover from a pandemic and play, plan for a more just future, these are the projects that create jobs, reduce emissions, and save lives, and they must be our priority. The current complete street law has made some inroads, as we've heard, but more needs to be done. We need faster state and local implementation of complete streets to blunt and reverse this worsening trajectory of traffic violence that I can assure you will only get worse. Humans are staying the same size, and our cars are getting bigger and faster and more powerful. And you simply need to look at a company like Dodge that says it's not producing EVs, it's producing basically electric muscle in its new iteration. That tells you everything you need to know about what is coming ahead on our roads. Right now, the 2001 Complete Street Act only applies to state roads that are being constructed, reconstructed, or rehabilitated, which means it can only be applied to a relatively small number of projects. This restriction limits the ability of the Complete Street Act to work as intended. As a result, cities that we've heard before across the state have been denied long overdue upgrades to their roads, and I know that my colleagues after me will speak more about that. Bill A7782, the Complete Street Maintenance Bill, sponsored by Member Rivera, thank you, would give municipalities resources and guidance to make their streets safer and save lives. And I wanna be clear here, as Amy and my colleagues have said before, this is not a blanket bill. It does not force a one-size-fit-all approach. This is about ease and tools and options in helping to make all streets safer regardless of the conditions and recognizing the local sensitivities. A7782 along with A8624 allows for context sensitivity, enabling local communities to put parameters in place for assessing complete street applications, making it easier for the towns and villages and cities across New York to implement projects with sustainable, life-saving complete street elements. In addition to the passage of these two, Transportation Alternatives urges Governor Hochul to swiftly sign A8936, sponsored by Assemblymember Fahey, thank you, which would increase state funding where the municipality agrees to fund a complete street design feature. Reducing the project cost responsibility of localities that want to incorporate complete street features makes it possible for more communities to choose, streets, to choose safe streets and to be protected by them. We have a traffic violence crisis. I can't stress this enough. Weekly, we are at vigils. We are getting updates on an hourly basis of our neighbors who are injured or killed simply crossing the street, going to work, going to a place of worship, a 99-year-old Holocaust survivor on his way to a place of worship, a five-year-old waiting at the bus stop. These are not statistics. They are not statistics. These are our neighbors, and we have a responsibility to support them. We, as you, will not accept that these numbers will continue to grow. And that's why we urge the movement of these three bills to strengthen complete streets. And we can set, use this to set New York as an example unto this nation of what's possible under the strong leadership that put people, not inanimate objects, first. I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. Appreciate your testimony. Is there anyone with any questions? Okay.
Ms. Fahey. Uh, thank you for all of your work. Um, uh, I, uh, I see the alerts every day. Uh, I get the alerts from, especially from New York City where it does seem almost daily that uh, we lose a pedestrian uh, to various forms of traffic violence. Uh, do you have some studies, and I, I feel this anecdotally, but I don't have any data on it. Uh, in the last two years, it seems that um, drivers are driving faster uh, there's more road rage. Is that part of the problem here, That uh, why we are seeing these dramatic j jumps in fatalities and, um, and crashes? Well, we've seen, uh, I, you know, there, there's obviously not um, one reason. If you look at, at a number of them, Assembly Member, you have one, when less people were driving on the street, especially with roads that are incredibly large, it served as an invitation for people to drive faster. The second is, again, I, I can't stress enough the, the deadly impact of larger cars. You have, you know, m most of the big three are no longer selling sedans. The vehicles that are being produced, especially if you look at a vehicle like the Ford F-150, the best-selling vehicle in America, you can sit 12 children in front of the vehicle and the driver cannot actually see them. So again, these are cars that are being placed on the roads where also with the invitation to drive faster, uh, when you get hit, you are not likely to survive. You have that, and then I think as you're seeing across other elements, um, there's increased road rage, and I think people have, uh, there are other conditions that may uh, be encouraging people to engage in more reckless behavior, but we're seeing that across New York City. And at the same time, I wanna show what's working. Speed safety cameras, which you have all helped to advance, are saving lives. Uh, road diets are saving lives. Complete streets are saving lives. Open streets are saving lives. Protected bike lanes are saving lives. Wider sidewalks are saving lives. Daylighting is saving lives. So while these numbers are increasing, again, I want to empower all of us. We have the tools. You all have built and, and unleashed these tools across New York, and the goal is to scale them, simply to scale them, to take what we know works and to bring it to every community that's in need. Again, there can be differences about what happens here or there, but we are on the losing end of a fight against larger inanimate objects that are only getting more powerful. This is an opportunity for cities to take our streets back by simply giving them to people and prioritizing their safety over anything else. Thank you for your extraordinary work Thank and you. advocacy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <coughs> Next, we have uh, Andy Bicking. Director of Government Relations and Public Policy for Scenic Hudson. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, uh, members of the committee, for the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon. Uh, and I also appreciate you holding this hearing. I know what a busy time of year it is back home in your districts, and uh, speaking for many advocates, thank you for listening in hearing about these issues. Uh, my name is Andy Bicking, Director of Government Relations and Public Policy for Scenic Hudson. Um, if you've followed the work of my organization, you'll know that we are focused on both the natural and the built environment in the Hudson Valley and are committed to the well-being of its residents. Today, we are proud to join uh, with the New York State Safe Streets Coalition and the requests that you have heard from that coalition. My testimony today may be somewhat unusual as it brings together um, an area of professional interest, the policy, and a deeply personal experience. Um, I have been a cyclist my whole life. I have been a bicycle commuter. I have been a bicycle courier. I ran a community bicycle program and earn a bike program for young children for four years. I have served on municipal committees in different towns and villages that I have lived in resulting in uh, streetscape improvements to help support bicyclists and pedestrians. And in my professional life, I'm privileged to work with many uh, professional planners at Scenic Hudson and interact with many government officials to the local level. And I hope I have a perspective on this issue that will be helpful to you today. Uh, unfortunately, I'm also a victim of um, traffic violence, having witnessed the death of a friend last year. Uh, my testimony may be difficult, as it does involve the death of a friend and personal trauma, but I'm sharing it with you today because I hope it does help illustrate the need for our great state to close loopholes in the 2011 Complete Streets legislation and fully commit to implementing complete streets and realizing all the benefits of complete streets policies in every region of the state. 
Um, I also advocated for the 2011 uh, Complete Streets policy and remember uh, the conversations with the legislature at that time quite well. Um, as I mentioned, last summer I was on a bicycle ride with two friends near my home in Kingston, New York. We began a ride on the Hudson River on the waterfront in Kingston, headed south to Rosendale on the Walker Valley Rail Trail, now part of the highly popular Empire State Trail, and returned northbound on the O&W Rail Trail to finish in uptown Kingston. The O&W dead ends in Washington Avenue, a popular local through fare. Uh, while crossing, I watched in horror as my friend John Lynch, whose um, partner Rose uh, Quinn is with us today, uh, John was struck and pinned beneath an automobile. Um, powerless to do anything that could transport John to safety, all I could do was hold his hand as I watched his life fade. The past cannot be undone, um, but I increasingly believe that this tragedy that shook me, John's friends and family and the broader community would have been much less likely to have occurred had the Complete Street policies been put into effect on Washington Avenue prior to John's death. The area is, and has been for years, a popular crossing for pedestrians and cyclists that use the rail trail, but there are no marked crossings that are convenient or nearby. Ironically, Washington Avenue was resurfaced shortly after this terrible incident, um, that I've described to you. Uh, and it looks very much the same that it uh, does today as it did on that tragic day, except that automobiles now drive faster on the smoother surface. If you know the city of Kingston and Ulster County, um, I think you, you will know that it prides itself on kind of progressive environmental policy, and I, I'm proud to be a local resident. Um, it has made a lot of wonderful efforts in the city of Kingston to include uh, users um, of the streets, pedestrians, cyclists, differently abled, and remarkable progress has been made by the current and previous administrations. Um, in my professional assessment, there is strong political will locally. That's why we see the development of beautiful bike lanes on Broadway. We see the development of uh, rail trails in the community and signage in certain areas. But it's very clear to me that even with that political leadership, the resources and the attention and the, the capacity to kind of go further and implement complete streets policies and other areas of the city that are very deserving just isn't there. Uh, so it's, it's with this story and these observations in mind, uh, in addition to Sina Cutson's understanding of local needs throughout the Hudson Valley, uh, that I support the governor signing Complete Streets funding legislation. Thank you to you and your colleagues for passing that this past session. And also encourage you to take up the Complete Streets application legislation and Complete Streets maintenance legislation, A8624 and A7782 respectively. So while I cannot say whether my friend John would still be with us had these three bills been law, I can say for certain that the situation on the ground at the location of his death would look different and would feel different had these bills been law. There might be a well-marked crossing lane for pedestrians and cyclists. There might be signage alerting motorists of the crossing and traffic might be calmer. And had these provisions been in fact, my experience on that day would have been very different. Professionally, on behalf of Sina Cutson and the certified planners we have on staff, I can affirmatively say that when complete streets policies are in effect, local communities experience many benefits. Our streets are safer for pedestrians, cyclists, the elderly, children, and differently abled residents. Our downtowns and community centers are more pleasant places to live and work. Our cities, towns, and villages are more appealing places for businesses to relocate and visitors to frequent. New York State has invested probably hundreds of millions, billions of dollars to help remake our downtowns. We see in the Regional Economic Development Councils a really strong emphasis on downtown revitalization. And the Mid-Hudson's Live Work Play strategy has centered many of the strategies that you're hearing about today. That has been wonderful, but there's still much work to do. Uh, ultimately, this work is about creating communities that have a greater innate sense of place, are more cohesive, and are more safe. 
And Chairman, if you'd allow me to deviate from my testimony for just a few moments, just having observed uh, the many wonderful comments and very thoughtful comments today and the questions of this body, um, there's a few themes that come to mind um, that I would just like to, to add on to my comments. Um, the first, as you heard from Jeff Olson, um, don't underestimate the value of technical corrections to the law. Uh, the bills that we are hearing from today in many respects are just a few changes in words. Uh, they are things that can be done. Uh, they are things that are, are understood. Also consider the value of education, um, in particular for the professional staff and the engineering community that's working on this. Uh, I, I love working with engineers. They're smart people. They, they do things and think things I'm not capable of doing. Um, but and sometimes it's important to add a little creativity to the process and think outside the box and think about how to apply policies in unique ways. Um, professional development may be in order in certain situations. Also, please consider local capacity. Um, it's no surprise that local government, uh, as we know, often, especially in our upstate rural communities, does not have the resources to do everything that they would like to do. So let's think about some targeted support to help them take the next step. Many of the projects that we would like to see happen throughout the state require environmental review. And I think we're all very aware that the State Environmental Quality Review Act, the kind of first and last defense of that, that very important law, are citizens themselves. So thinking about what incentives we can do to help drive public participation, uh, whether it's through advisory committees or other means when it comes to traffic improvements, it could be a very critical strategy. Um, as a cyclist, managing speed, crossings, and signage, the physical cues that drivers, pedestrians, and cyclists need to guide their behavior is what's ultimately important. A sign is just a sign. And, you know, I, I hate to say it, but <laughs> I've sped. I'm sure all of you have too. Um, and the real way to change driver behavior, the real way to change cyclist behavior is by putting the visual cues, the physical cues that can help guide them towards the type of behavior we'd like to see. Um, I would also note that the rules that exist um, often from a cyclist perspective differ considerably from what people actually experience. And, the, the importance of locally specific strategies that are context uh, sensitive and, and having a discussion about that before projects move forward in the pipeline is a critical strategy. Um, and finally, I'll just conclude, you know, while I, I do believe wholeheartedly that we need to be thinking about big projects, the kind of whole street makeover that we can all imagine to create complete streets, let's not neglect the importance of aggressive incrementalism. Uh, when you do resurfacing, when you do uh, minor improvements and maintenance on roads, let's think about what some of those very common sense, simple things that can be doing to help educate users of a road to create a safer environment. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate the opportunity and appreciate your time today. I'm going to be happy to take any questions if you have them. Thank you very much, sir. Are there any questions? Ms. Barrett. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for sharing your story um, and for your thoughtful. I mean, from from your. I mean, you, you bring a lot to the to the mix here. So for your thoughtful uh, recommendations, the the one thing that I I think um, keeps going through my mind, being obviously from the Hudson Valley, as you know, is this you know one size fits all kind of approach. Is, can you talk a little bit about how, if you were making statewide policy? how we can be sure that we're not forcing things down the throats of communities that aren't quite ready or regions that need different kinds of things. I mean, we have you know, a lot more small cities, rural areas in the Hudson Valley than say downstate or in, in, in some of our uh, upstate cities. How, how can we make this work best um, for all of us? Yeah, that, that's a, a great question, Assemblywoman. Um, thank you for that. Yeah, in, in my experience, um, the way you get to kind of context-sensitive solutions is by encouraging the development of local plans um, and supporting the development of local plans that meet kind of state policy. 
and then you know, providing the resources to help the local communities not just have a plan on the shelf, but actually translate that into zoning and code that can make a difference. And throughout every step of the way, making sure that the incentives are there for public participation from members of the community, as well as the special interest organizations that exist. Um, you know, I, I tend to believe that a, a transparent process um, that really gets everyone together and developing understanding in the creation of a plan is ultimately going to give you the most uh, sustainable and effective long-term result. Thank you. Ms. Simon. It's always very hard to see. Is it on? Okay, it's on. Uh, you can never really see the red light, whether it's red or not. I just want you to know. It's, it's a lighting thing. Um, so thank you for your testimony, and um, uh, which I know was very difficult and, and painful. Um, but you also talked about something that we haven't heard yet. Um, I tend to think of traffic calming, for example, as behavior modification for drivers, um, and how important it is that you signal through the road um, the way people should be driving and behaving. Um, but that's also something that isn't necessarily as apparent to others. And I was struck by your suggestion about professional development. Um, are you familiar with any professional development efforts that are done uh, with planners, for example, and traffic engineers? I know a lot of the people who write these EISs and um, are uh, in, in the business of doing uh, that work are often very hostile to the notion of, uh, uh, you know, complete streets. Thank you. Well, let me first say that I have a huge amount of respect for the planners and engineers who kind of create the physical environment that we all, all live and work in. Uh, they do very important work, and I know their jobs are very challenging. Um, as we know, they're also, they're, they're accredited. Uh, you know, they have to receive a certain amount of professional training um, on an annual basis, I believe, to uh, maintain their licenses. Uh, you know, I'll answer your perspective, uh, your question from the perspective of my bias as a conservationist, which is, is what I do with most of my professional time. Um, you know, the conservation community has been um, very effective, I think, at providing professional development that meet different uh, accreditation kind of standards and getting those kind of, those kind of courses approved so that there are options and that the, the folks who are doing this work at the municipal level or the state level can then further their careers, develop their body of knowledge in a specific way. Um, I don't know um, specifically whether or not that exists uh, in kind of the smart growth uh, world and the traffic safety world. I imagine there may be something, um, but I can certainly follow up with my colleagues and get back to you um, with a more specific answer. Thank you, because um, it's coming from my own field, which is disability civil rights law. When the ADA was passed, there were a ton of programs about what the ADA required, but they were mostly done by defense attorneys who uh, didn't really like it. <laughs> Um, and so I can see a great, uh, you know, an opportunity for mischief there as well. Um, and so that's why I asked. I think it would be great if we have people doing that kind of training who are actually committed to it. So thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you, sir. We appreciate your time. Okay. All right. Next, Justin Booth, Executive Director of Go Bike Buffalo. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Go Thank you right for having ahead. me. Thank you for holding this hearing on sure. Complete Streets. Uh, yes, I'm Justin Booth, Executive Director at Go Bike Buffalo. I also chair the City of Buffalo Common Council's Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Board, which reviews all city thoroughfare, and, uh, thoroughfare plan projects, um, and also a member of the uh, New York State Safe Streets Coalition. Um, I've also had an opportunity to work with over 100 towns and villages across New York State on complete streets. So I bring a perspective of not just from working in the City of Buffalo, but also suburban and rural areas as well. 
So we know as complete streets are designed and meant to be operated to enable safe access for all roadway users, including pedestrians, bicyclists, transit riders, and motors, regardless of age or ability. Yet when 72% of all trips in the United States are less than a mile <coughs> are driven, there are negative consequences uh, for people in our communities. One in three children in New York State are considered overweight and obese, largely due to a lack of safe places to walk or bike, which significantly limits opportunities for activity. According to a 2011 New York State Comptroller report, this is costing the state $327 million annually in direct and indirect medical costs. And for adults, this jumps to $11.8 billion annually. When a one-mile walk takes approximately 15 minutes, and the Surgeon General recommends a minimum of 30 minutes a day to maintain health, designing safe, complete streets is a simple way for people to be healthier as part of their daily routines, like walking to the school or to the market. In fact, the New York State Department of Health's Creating Healthy Schools and Communities program specifically funds organizations around New York State to work with communities on developing complete streets policies and projects because it is an evidence-based mechanism to improve community health. Complete streets are also an equity issue for low-income households. According to AAA, as we heard earlier, the average cost of car ownership is upwards of $10,000 annually uh, in 2022, uh, which is a continued increase from 2019 when we saw that number just over $9,000, and that number continues to rise. With the median household income in Buffalo, New York, at 30, uh, just over $39,000 a year, and 28% of the population living in poverty, the cost of owning and operating a vehicle is a barrier to access basic needs, jobs, and future opportunities. In New York State, the DEC, DEC has identified the transportation sector represents 28% of all greenhouse gas emissions that are contributing to global climate change. This could easily be reduced through complete streets by simply converting the 72% of all trips under a mile made in a vehicle into a walking or cycling trip instead. Between 2017 and 2021, the New York State Department of Transportation recorded 121,807 automobile involved crashes, or an average of 67 crashes per day in Erie and Niagara counties, with 64 people dying each year. Despite being involved in a far smaller proportion of total crashes, only 3%, one in four fatal crashes resulted in the death of a person walking and cycling. The New York State Department of Health recognizes traffic deaths and injuries as a major preventable public health problem. In fact, crashes are the leading cause of injury-related death, second leading cause of injury-related hospitalizations, and third leading cause of injury-related emergency department visits in New York State. The resulting care needed presents a significant public cost, with the combined hospitalization emergency department charges averaging 1.1 billion annually. <coughs> Implementing complete streets is essential to making our roadways safe. While some may think that a key attribute are sidewalks and bicycle lanes, it is actually the slow vehicle speeds because we know that if a pedestrian is struck by a vehicle traveling at 40 miles per hour, they have a 15% chance of survival, while at 20 miles per hour, their survival rate goes to 95%. A model case study in Erie County, New York, is the village of Hamburg, just south of the city of Buffalo with a population of just under 10,000 people. It had a decline following the collapse of the steel industry and opening up of a nearby retail mall. In 2001, the DOT proposed improvements on Route 62, a state roadway, which would add a vehicle travel lane and shorten sidewalks along the village's one mile long Main Street. Concerned locals formed a citizens group and developed a design alternative which was implemented in 2009 that narrowed existing travel lanes from 12 feet to 10 feet to reduce speeds, enable them to add street trees, on-street parking, and bike lanes. Signalized intersections were removed in favor of roundabouts. Mid-block crosswalks were added along with curb extensions at intersections. Between completion in 2009 and 2013, vehicle crashes on the street fell 66% and injuries fell 60%. Since this public investment in complete streets was made, business owners, inspired by the new road, spent a total of seven million on 33 building projects in the four years after construction. The number of building permits rose from 15 in 2005 to 96 in 2010, and the property values along Route 62 more than doubled in the same time period. 
The village of Hamburg should not be the exception to the rule, but the model for all projects to follow in our villages and towns across New York State. As chair of the City of Buffalo Common Council's Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Board, I've had the opportunity to view and provide recommendations on all thoroughfare plans developed by the City of Buffalo. Since being the first city in New York State to adopt a complete streets policy in 2008, implementation has relied on maintenance projects. When a street is being repaved, the City of Buffalo has recognized the most cost-effective opportunity by simply adding some additional paint to slow vehicle speeds, improve pedestrian access, and add bicycle facilities. Recent data in Governing Magazine coming out of New York City DOT has shown simple changes such as road diets, bicycle lanes, curb extensions, turn calming can reduce the number of people killed or seriously injured on our streets from 15 to 30%. While the unprecedented COVID pandemic upended many aspects of daily life, including how people get around, one terrible long-term trend was unchanged. The alarming increase in people being struck and killed while walking, which is at a 40-year high disproportionately impacting older adults and those living in low-income communities of color. According to the American Society of Civil Engineers Code of Ethics, engineers first and foremost must protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public. If this is the case, the traffic engineering profession is failing us. It is essential that complete streets are applied to all projects, that additional funding is provided to local municipalities, and they are implemented in a context-sensitive manner to equitably improve the safety, health, and economic vitality of our communities. It is no longer appropriate nor morally acceptable to solely focus on vehicle efficiency on our roadways when we have the tools and cost-effective measures to improve the quality of life for all people, regardless of age or ability in New York State. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, do we have any questions? Mr. Rivera. How you doing? <laughs> so, um, you mentioned you have a role a bit with the city, obviously that's as in your volunteer capacity, you don't actually work for the city, but um, in the city's not particularly a wealthy city, it's, it's you know, financially it's, it's probably not where anybody would want it to be. That being said, when municipalities are in tough financial positions, sometimes it would uh, lead them to cut corners on things and to not necessarily take certain steps that other municipalities or similar to what we've been talking about today the, with the expense that we ha that's associated with, with what we're talking about. Um, what are some of the things that you've been able to do that aren't that expensive, that, that really haven't come at a financial big burden to the, to the city? A lot of projects that the organization has done is simply with paint. Um, for the last several years, we painted more crosswalks in the city of Buffalo than the city of Buffalo. We've worked with council members to identify key locations in their districts uh, where residents have consistently uh, complained about having speeding vehicles or unsafe uh, areas around schools. And we've gone out, the, out with cost-effective measures, paint, um, temporary curbing, um, public art in some of these spaces, and transformed an intersection for about $2,500 and did the pre and post uh, data analysis to determine how uh, it was being effective in meeting the objectives that it was laid out for us. Um, whereas long-term infrastructure costs could be upwards of $100,000 for that intersection. So it allows us to do some immediate safety improvements today, making the streets safe for people to walk and bike. Um, while at the same time using it as a public outreach process to engage the public to better understand how these new treatments can be utilized um, before that longer term capital investment is actually made. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Something you uh, just said, sir, kind of struck me. So it doesn't mean maybe we need to have some education as far as what complete streets really means in terms of um, telling uh, our populations that, um, you know, maybe just a sign or a painted crosswalk or something like that could have a real bearing on um, streets that are having problems. And that maybe that should be done as, you know, as we go along to further this as well. So, I, there's just so much to think about in this area. So I do appreciate your, uh, uh, your testimony and uh, thank you very much for your time.
Seeing no other questions, thank you. Mr. Edward Brennan, President of the Albany Bicycle Coalition. Thanks. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this hearing, and thank you for allowing me to speak. I am Edward Brennan. I am a resident of the city of Albany. In March of this year, our Common Council voted unanimously in support of the passage of these Complete Streets bills as contained in the Crash Victims' Rights and Safety Act, uh, including the Complete Streets bill that um, our representative Fahey uh, sponsored that I, that I've had a helpful C signed. I'm also president of the Albany Bicycle Coalition. Uh, our not-for-profit has been promoting bicycling and bicycle and pedestrian safety in the capital region since 2004. Every year, uh, we hold a local ride of silence along with uh, organizations throughout the world remembering cyclists that perished on public roads. Last year, we began our ride with a service remembering over 40 cyclists pedestrians, and motorists that have died on, uh, since the year 2000 on nearby Central Avenue that connects Albany and Schenectady. Central Avenue is something of a local poster child for the need for complete streets in the capital region. After so many deaths, the New York State Department of Transportation conducted a Central Avenue pedestrian safety study that was published in 2015. Some changes were implemented, but deaths have continued. I don't doubt that it will take significant changes and uh, probably large expenditures to make Central Avenue significantly safer. My testimony, however, relates to Rap Road, uh, which is a road that many could use to avoid Central Avenue to get between the town of Colony and the city of Albany and between Gilderland and the, and the uh, town of Colony. And this is the same Rap Road that Mr. Kowalczyk mentioned earlier just that his section of Rap Road is south of Washington Avenue. I'm talking about the section of Rap Road north of Washington Avenue. Washington Avenue, coincidentally, is the same road as where Mrs. Mrs. Sawyer's son, Roger, uh, was hit and killed uh, just a few years ago. Um, making Rap Road significantly safer would have been much less of an effort than fixing, for example, Central Avenue. Rap Road becomes uh, Lincoln Avenue in Colony, where it intersects with Central Avenue to the north. Rap Road leads to Crossgates Mall, which is an important shopping center to the south that Mr. Uh, Kowalczyk was speaking of earlier. Rap Road goes through the Albany Pine Bush, which is a unique, unique ecological area that has hiking pads connecting both sides of Rap Road, and you can frequently see hikers going along the sides of Rap Road, going from one footpath to another. Rap Road overpasses New York State Thruway Interstate 90 with a wide shoulder that is relatively safe for cyclists and pedestrians. Rap Road is also an endpoint for the Six Mile Waterworks multi-use path that allows cyclists and pedestrians to go safely underneath nor the Northway Interstate I-87. Safe places for cyclists and pedestrians to cross interstates deserve special mention because they are so few and far between and because they require significant capital expenditures to create. One of the 40 plus persons we commemorated at our last ride was a uh, silence was a 39 year old man, Jeremy Williams, who was struck and killed back on Central Avenue while trying to cycle through the Central Avenue interchange with the Northway. Making safe bike ped crossings of interstates isn't cheap. Where such safe crossings have been created, you would think there would be reasonable efforts to make them more useful. The problem with this particular 0.6 mile segment of Rap Road that I was talking about is that it gets a great deal of traffic and it has a windy section with little or no shoulder. Years ago, we saw Rap Road as long overdue for some kind of major repair. We wrote our mayor, we sent many emails, we spoke to like, uh, local transportation officials, and we even distributed a little pamphlet we made ourselves about the need to improve safety along this one short stretch of Rap Road. And we were surprised one day to see a project started. The road was milled down, it was, it was quickly repaved. We had no warning or chance for input, though we had made ourselves pests about this road for many years. There was no significant change to the shoulder. And now motor vehicles have a fresh, smooth 
surface, facilitating higher speeds, uh, which are probably more dangerous to the other vulnerable users on the road. Unless somebody dies here, I doubt the road will be looked at again for another 20 years. We need to expand complete streets considerations to projects like Rap Road so we're not missing important opportunities to improve transportation safety. Maintenance, resurfacing, and pavement recycling projects that extend the life of roadways make economic sense. As a taxpayer, I think that's wonderful. But a complete streets perspective still is essential to make sure that extending the life of a roadway isn't unnecessarily extending existing dangers to the lives of those, all those people that use those roadways. So if I could just say two bullet points. One, uh, don't let this, uh, the complete streets law um, leave low-hanging fruit. Uh, things that could be done very economically, more economically than other projects that, that, you are, uh, that would be funded. And two, as I said, don't make the laudable goal of extending the life of a road also extend situations that needlessly, needlessly uh, endanger people. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Are there any questions? Any comments? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. James B. Jones, owner and CEO of uh, Mode Choice Engineering, PLLC. I just want to let the committee know that uh, uh, Mr. Jones emailed his testimony after the hearing began, so we don't have we don't have copies of that right now, but we'll get them to you. Go ahead, sir. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, I'm James Jones, owner of Mode Choice Engineering. Uh, I created the business in 2019, just before COVID. Actually, I got incorporated in uh, 2020. Um, but anyway, I retired from the town of Tonawanda as a town engineer. So I've been in municipal engineering for over 30 years. And um, I am a traffic engineer by profession. That's my specialty. Um, but while I was town engineer, uh, I oversaw tens of millions of dollars worth of public works projects, uh, many trails. Um, and we formulated our complete streets policy in 2017 but so I bring um, those perspectives here because I want to go over some of the uh, salient points about traffic engineering and um, bringing safe streets to fruition and you know we have our laws our regulations our policies and procedures and we have a gap, a huge gap, between actually getting those policies incorporated into our work and actually seeing the fruits of our intentions happen. Um, so maybe I'll try and shed some light on that. So the Transportation Equity Act, which is a federal um, policy or a federal law uh, for the 20th search, 21st century, came about in, in 1998. Um, so this has been around a long time to provide transportation equity to our streets. Um, and it formed the base, the framework for building transportation equity alternatives back into mobility networks in the U.S. Transportation equity relates to the safe movement of people and goods by all legal users of the road. So, um, you know, the streets are uh, the public right-of-way. They are for the public and they are for moving um, people and goods. And that's their role. And that's always been their role since the beginning of the time. Um, the states after the T21 came about then began to adopt their own policies and um, laws and regulations to advance more equity into the transportation systems. Um, in New York State, you know, we passed our Complete Streets Law in 2011. It's already been noted here. However, it does provide those categorical exclusions for uh, certain projects, certain rehabilitation projects uh, that are funded 
and, and also funded by other public sources. That's the low-hanging fruit that we've talked about in the past here. For the past 11 years, various communities have adopted their own policies um, regarding complete streets with those same categorical exclusions. So there's, no com uh, there's nothing compelling them to move forward. Uh, and it's, it's uh, because it is more work and local municipalities and local transportation engineers have a dearth of work to achieve. They have um, influences from all over the place and it's really hard to make progress when you start introducing other uh, work into the, uh, into the fold. Um, these exclusions have created a significant hindrance to incorporating the required transportation equity and allows agencies to further avoid uh, achieving these desired outcomes. It just basically allows them to kick the can down the road. The life cycle costs, the life cycles of the projects that are going in, uh, if you follow the New York State DOT Highway uh, Design Manual, which is what really dictates how we move forward here in the state, that HCM is a critical piece of um, policy that the DOT has used for a long, long time and really has not um, looked at that with a different perspective. But that becomes a default de facto document that counties and municipalities use because they don't have the legal or the uh, technical expertise. So they rely on the state DOT to guide that. Um, and of course the DOT is working in an echo chamber and they are not required, you know, the folks who are licensed professional engineers are not required to um, uh, seek out continuing education because they're part of a uh, exempt uh, workforce. They're a collective bargaining unit. They don't have to do that. <laughs> so they're missing out on some interesting and best practices. They only hear it um, from the consultants when a specific project comes in. Uh, compliance with the Complete Streets Act is subjective to a culture and adequated, antiquated regulatory structure that's prioritized the automobile over the safety of the other legal users of the right-of-way. Safety from driver's perspective is very different from safety from the vulnerable <coughs> user's perspective. Those are two different definitions. Uh, so it depends on your perspective. Uh, for the past 100 years, uh, thank you, um, uh, Robert Moses, uh, transportation professionals have prioritized designs, assuming that the automobile free flow condition was the primary importance and um, land use contexts were neglected. Um, the profession understands now that the priority choice has caused severe harm related to land use, transportation equity, and safety and is slowly beginning to apply its best practices to a safety first model versus a free flow condition model. The Civil Engineering and Professional Engineering Society Codes of Essex, which Justin mentioned, require that the individual hold the public safety, health, and welfare paramount, allowing the automobile to be the dominant design priority uh, is now considered negligent in the profession. So as professional engineers design streets, if they are negligent in providing the best practices, uh, they are subjecting their clients and themselves to uh, liability as opposed to um, being risk avoidance, uh, being risk, uh, they become just maintaining the status quo, which is known to be harmful. Um, pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure must be prioritized and incorporated into any appropriate context where the potential for movement of pedestrians, of bicyclists, are not part of a controlled access highway. So a controlled access highway is a, uh, a highway uh, that kind of vernacular came around back when the interstate system was built in the 50s, uh, limiting access to the highway and who can use it, you know, no horses, no bicycles, things like that. You see the sign at the entrance of the highway. That 
type of context uh, um, has been that those highway design parameters have been used on city streets and local streets inappropriately. Um, so reorganizing the reorganization of roads and streets, the term highway should be reserved for controlled access facilities only and can be accomplished through value engineering with context sensitive areas during the street resurfacing, rehabilitation or reconstruction projects. The use of highway design guidance and stand standards when appropriate, whenever bicycle and movements may occur. Uh, NACTO is an example, design guidance that should be used for these design professionals outside of the controlled access highway. So instead of using the highway capacity manual or the, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, uh, highway design manual from the DOT, they should be using NACTO. Um, the, uh, um, and the, the DOT also has a project development manual, so it's all steeped like a, like a, a cup of tea. It's all steeped in this antiquated uh, free flow condition for the automobile. That, that needs to be re-envisioned and re-evaluated uh, by the DOT. And due to the complicated nature of public works projects, uh, their expense can lead to the ability to be flexible in design and treatment of our streets using techniques that can be quickly and cost effectively uh, to conform best practices in order to provide more immediate safety and connected uh, connectivity enhancements to the vulnerable users of the right of way. So what that what that means is there's there's really uh, opportunities to build networks. Uh, we talked about uh, the independent projects that build a bike lane and they really don't see use because the bike lanes don't connect anything. You really need to build that connectivity to really uh, see the fruition of, of connectivity happen. And uh, so, you know, an example of what I'm using to describe here is a project in the town of Tonawanda. Uh, on Sheridan Drive, which is State Route 324. Um, it's an eight lane, principal arterial, um, huge streets. There's not too many of these eight lane streets in New York State, but we have one. It was designed back in the, in the 20s uh, for that future traffic pro uh, projection that never really manifested. It's a, it's a busy street, but it's, um, it's, it's really uh, tremendously over-designed. Um, the, uh, the planning documents that were generated and provided by the town of Tonawana to the Department of Transportation, so this is our bike master plan, the comprehensive plan, indicated that Sheridan Drive should be rede redesigned to incorporate protected bike lanes. Bike lanes. Uh, the DOT acknowledged those recommendations in their own internal feasibility study. Uh, however, when it came time to a resurfacing project, the uh, highway design manual does not require public uh, public engagement. It does not require a seeker, and it does not really require them to do anything other than put back exactly what's there. So that's uh, that can was kicked down the road ten years, 10, 20 years. Uh, you know, uh, so we're missing those we're missing those opportunities to really make an impactful change in our communities. Um, it's, it's really a disservice to the public. And we as public service, I still consider myself a public servant, uh, we're missing those chances. And that's our duty. We have a duty to provide those opportunities and at every chance. You know, we're losing 40,000 people a year in this country to traffic violence. And almost 96% of those crashes are avoidable by proper design, you know. So, um, that's uh, that's my statement, okay. <laughs> for the most part. So, uh, engineers are not the best communicators. Uh, believe me, I, I, I apologize. I, I, I think you got your my, point my, across. My, my, I'm trying to get my spirit and my heart into this. So, no, thank I you. think you, I think you got your point across. Um, would you like that, Mr. Rivera? How you doing, Jim? So. Um, a bit about your, your time there at the town of Tonawanda. You were engineer there for how long? Uh, 30 years. I was town engineer for 10 years. Gotcha. And I've been thinking a lot about what our first speaker was talking about in regards to just sort of the, 
you know, sky's falling numbers around what how expensive things could be. In your time there at the town, and your town is how, how, how many? Seventy-two thousand. So it's a good sized town. Yeah, uh, with a lot of traffic in it, certainly, uh, and all different kinds of roads. There were some examples that you could probably think of. You don't have to name specific streets because, uh, you know, some of us haven't driven on them. But there's some examples of uh, projects that you took on as town engineer uh, that were complete streets related that, that weren't, you know, astronomical in cost. Right. So one that jumps to my mind right now, our highway department um, is, is just remilled or just milled and resurfaced East Park Drive, which is part of uh, the Two Mile Creek Greenway. It connects to the Empire State Trail. It's a, uh, a loop that goes around in the industrial area of town. So it connects uh, large international corporations like DuPont and Dunlop. Um, that street was just milled and paved and the highway department and the town engineer did their own little design to restripe it. And now it has bicycle lanes on it. So that was, they're doing the mill and pave anyway, and it's just a matter of adding paint in the right spots. And that was, it's, it's not rocket science, believe me. It's very easy to do things like that. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we have uh, Brianna Durkee, Government Relations Director of the American Heart Association. Good afternoon, and thank you, Assembly Chairman Magnarelli and members of the Transportation Committee for allowing me to be here today on behalf of my organization and offer supporting comments on strengthening the Complete Streets Act of 2011 and enacting policies that will be key to give communities resources and guidance to make their streets safer so that individuals can live safer, healthier lives. I am Brianna Durkee, American Heart Association Government Relations Director for New York State. The American Heart Association strongly believes that communities with safe streets that include bike lanes, sidewalks, crosswalks, and curb ramps improve everyone's health by making it easier and safer for them to be active. We all want and deserve to live a safe, in safe and healthy communities. Complete streets policies make communities and neighborhoods more livable by ensuring all people can get where they need to go safely. They also help people feel more connected with their neighbors and improve quality of life. As a health organization, we know that complete streets have the potential to not only improve neighborhood safety, but also improve people's health. Children and families become more active when they have access to complete streets and sidewalks. Our data shows that communities that build and invest in complete streets are associated with increased physical activity. Living in a highly walkable environment is associated with reduced risk for cardiovascular disease, lower prevalence of high body mass index, and decreased risk for diabetes. Despite the Complete Streets Act of 2011, which we recognized was a great step forward at the time, there are still problems and barriers that exist that need to be addressed. To make this short, to, and name some of a few, getting around by walking or biking can be extremely difficult for children and families in some New York State communities as they lack the safety features such as sidewalks, bike lanes, and crosswalks. We know communities with few to no sidewalks experience more crashes, and neighborhoods have become increasingly more congested with traffic. Additionally, children are less active today and get less physical activity, which leads to health-related con conditions later on in life, such as diabetes. But this is not only about living a healthier lifestyle, but also health equity. Many of our New York low-income communities and communities of color have lacked well-maintained routes to parks, schools, roads, and sidewalks for some time. In many cases, they simply do not have the transportation <coughs> options at all. These are the same neighborhoods that we often see have higher rates of chronic diseases like diabetes and heart disease. Our data shows that there are major disparities related to complete streets that need to be addressed. We know that 
streets with sidewalks on both sides of the street are, are significantly more common in high income communities than in middle income or low income communities. Yet we see that the children from low income and BIOPOC households are more likely to bike or walk to school than their white individual counterparts or higher income students. So what's the solution here? New York must invest in policies that strengthen the Complete Streets Act that improves the way communities design and build streets and roads. Instead of prioritizing motor vehicles, neighborhoods must be designed and built for the safety of everyone, including those who bike, walk, use a wheelchair, use public transportation, or drive. Creating more complete streets in all neighborhoods will help to encourage people to take the first steps in living a longer, healthier life. New York must prioritize complete streets policies as a major step in addressing not only street safety, but health equity and giving all New Yorkers the tools to live a healthier lifestyle. Thank you. Thank you very much. And for the rest of the committee, um, uh, Ms. Durkee is going to email her testimony into us later. So I appreciate your time. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. And finally, uh, last but definitely not least, Rosanna Cotto, Beatrice, New York Bicycling Coalition. Thank you for waiting this out. <laughs> okay. And again, you'll send us your testimony? Yes, okay. yes, I will. Thank you very much. Go right ahead. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having us here today. My name is Rosanna Cotto Atres. I am a board member with the New York Bicycling Coalition. We're a statewide organization reaching over 7,000 people that use bicycles for transportation, recreation, exercise, and for employment purposes. I'm an avid cyclist. Um, I've done a lot of bike rides around the state. Me and my husband bike around a lot. And up until two months ago, that was the main way of transportation for me. As a former undocumented person, I was unable to get a driver's license for a long time. So I got around by bicycles, by buses, by walking, and so I want to bring the voice of a lot of those workers who are forced to get around you know, by biking, using the bus, or walking as their main form of transportation. We are proud members of the New York State Safe Streets Coalition. The New York Bicycling Coalition worked to get the current Complete Streets Law passed because our members and bicyclists all over the state need safe infrastructure. Infrastructure such as bike lanes, and particularly protected bike lanes, are the number one issue that our members in every corner of the state are demanding. We recognized years ago that there are limits to the complete, complete streets law, and the funding bill passed by the Assembly and the Senate, as well as other bills currently being considered, are, will address the funding gaps and the implementation challenges that will ensure more roads across the state are safe for all users. The New York Bicycling Coalition is push, pushing for the passage of this set of complete street bills to increase the roads covered by the complete streets law, expand the types of projects undertaken by the New York State Department of Transportation that could include complete streets design, and most importantly, to increase the funding necessary for local municipalities to implement complete streets design for the safety of their communities. We know why complete streets matter and why this set of bills is so important. They consider all users of the road and incorporate design that ensures that drivers, pedestrians, cyclists, wheelchair users, people that use strollers are all safe. They reduce the number and severity of transportation accidents. As we heard from others, one of the leading causes of death among U.S. residents, especially children, are transportation accidents. Complete street designs are unique to each community, taking into account the traffic demands of the area, how all users of the road can be protected, and the kind of design that best fits the needs of the road. Many complete streets designs are easy to implement, yet have exponential benefits. As we heard from some of the other speakers, some of these designs can include traffic calming techniques that ensure that drivers follow a safer speed, carb cuts to ensure that wheelchairs, strollers, shopping carts, and pedestrians of all ages and abilities can easily navigate crossing a street, bicycle lanes that encourage new and experienced bicyclists to ride safely on the road instead of on the sidewalk or among fast-moving vehicles. In turn, this will make the road safe for all users. And finally, things like signals, lane striping, and dedicated lanes likewise demarcate access for each user on the road. 
While it is ideal for complete streets designs to be included when planning new roads and major renovation projects, we know and we've heard from others today that many roads across the state can benefit from safer designs even if they're not undergoing major changes. The Complete Streets Maintenance Bill is so important to expanding the types of roads and projects that are eligible for complete street design. By lowering the project size threshold for complete streets projects, many more upstate, rural, and small town communities will benefit from being able to select complete street design improvements. Today we're here to show our support for this important set of legislation. We thank the legislators for recognizing the importance of the funding and to Assemblymember Fahey for pushing for the Complete Streets Design uh, Funding Bill. And we urge the Transportation Committee to pass the Complete Streets Maintenance and Application Bills to ensure that more roads across the state incorporate safety designs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thank you so much for your testimony and I want to take this opportunity uh, to thank everyone for being here today. I thought this was a very interesting and uh, uh, worthwhile committee meeting, committee hearing, excuse me. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks. Thanks.